three, two, one. I must go punch that baby. That was a quote from Poor Things. <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> As I was searching it up, it was the first one that came up. I was like, you know what? I did like that quote, actually. <laughs> um, I'm Adam from Your Movie Sex. This is Sardonicast. Hello. I'm Alex from I Hate Everything and... Uh... I got an even better quote with much better dialogue for you. Oh, please. If you got some really good quotes in the bag, you can always let me know before an episode starts because I've just, I have given up so long ago. I just search one up like as soon as the episode starts. No, I can't, starts, I can't, I'm, like, I'm kind of attached to your like mad scramble to like, oh, yeah. Now. So <laughs> yeah, you don't want to, you one. don't want to ruin that. So, <laughs> it's a yeah. part of it now. Um, it adds to the character. All right, go for it. No, but here's this forget poor things. That's, that's overrated writing. This is the forgettable film. But understand I am a child of war. I don't know if I'm even capable of love. The very idea of love was beaten out of me. I was taught that love is weakness. Remember that? No. No, I don't remember that at all. <laughs> Actually, I really don't. <laughs> oh, oh, Zachy boy. Oh, Zachary. Zachariah. What are we going to do with you? Pray. <laughs> uh, so yeah, we okay, I saw a, a Reddit thread uh, being like, "I wish they would cover better movies." And I'm like, "We do." Yeah, I saw that same one. <laughs> we yeah, we do. It's normally at least one good movie an episode. Yeah, we don't normally do like full bad movie episodes. Yeah, you gotta understand. There's gonna be people clicking on this because of the Rebel Moon part, but we're still talking about poor things and fucking wind that shakes the barley, right? Yeah, We're yeah, still and people have to stuff. also remember um, we're sometimes a little bit restricted by the weird release dates. We probably oh, could yeah, have done more things a bit earlier, but it's only just came out last Friday for me. So mm -hmm. yeah, sometimes that does affect like the cadence at which it comes yeah. out. But don't worry, I mean, we talk about plenty of good movies over here. We got Loach coming up, but first we got that Snyder, <clears throat> the most art house of the ones today, or to Snyder, as they call him. He's definitely an odd something. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, so I watched this a uh, couple weeks ago because <laughs> I, I was, yeah, I wanted to try and do a watch along for it because there's no way in hell I would just be like sitting silently. You know, I already mm -hmm. know what type of movie this is. I already know. I have an experience with this director kind of know what I'm in for. The trailer looked like shit. That's a dead giveaway. Yeah. It's yeah. also just a Star Wars clone, which I thought from the title and poster it was a Star Wars movie before I even watched a second of the trailer. And then I watched mm -hmm. the trailer. I'm like, is this a Star Wars movie? And then people were saying it wasn't. And then I find out later that he that he pitched it as a Star Wars movie. There were lightsabers and everything. But they turned him down at Lucasfilm. Even Lucasfilm turned away <laughs> Zack Snyder. So he held on to it for like 20 years. <laughs> and then decided to release it as soon as everyone has Star Wars fatigue. As soon as everyone's yeah. sick of this shit, he's like, now's the time. <laughs> Fantastic timing. A two-parter, nonetheless. They funded this at Netflix. Oh my God, a two-parter. Yeah. They mm -hmm. have so much confidence and faith in him. I guess people clicked on. Yeah, it. they're going in on the transmedia, the comic books. They they got plans. They got plans for Rebel Moon over at Netflix for some reason. I guess the success of uh, what was it called, Army of the Dead? His... Army of the Dead Pixels. Is that what? It is? Yeah, that's right. Um, I could remember nothing about that film, so I had to re-listen to our review from whenever that came out to yeah. uh, remind myself of that awful, boring film as well. But at least this one wasn't as long as that. <laughs> I could give it that. And it didn't oh. have loads of cover songs, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's one thing. I mean this it kinda just it kinda just goes by and then you're you forget you watched the movie. So right before Alex and I started recording this, we thought we were just gonna do poor things and win the shake the barley. Mm -hmm. We completely forgot. Alex watched it today. I watched it a couple weeks ago. <laughs> we both completely forgot <laughs> that we were even going to talk about this movie. <laughs> That's the only reason I watched it. So this is my this is my dedication to the audience, right? Thank like, you. I, when when this film came out on the on the December twenty second, I I watched maybe about half of it, like in bed on my iPad or something, and I fell asleep at a certain point. Um, 
and woke up while Conan the Barbarian was riding a like an eagle thing. Yeah. A, I don't know. I thought another movie had started or something. It was like a oh, yeah, thing from Harry Potter, like flying around with. <laughs> so I was like, oh, okay. Um, and then I forgot about it until today where I started the film again and watched it from the beginning. And Why would you do that? Time, so, because I didn't take notes and there was no chance in hell <laughs> I was going to remember a single detail from it. So, And I figured you weren't going to remember that much either. So someone's I took gotta... notes, <laughs> but I mean... No, I bet you won't remember anything, though. No. I mean, like, you reminded me of the Avatar Eagle the... training cliched scene. Uh, that was yeah. funny. The characters... I wrote down a note for that. The characters... The, the uh, like, Texan space cowboy man. His name was Hickman. Hickman. Oh, you're talking about... You're talking about... Uh... The guy that made the bet. The big boy. Who then got eaten well stomped on i think by the eagle oh that okay yeah Griffin. hickman i see Hick, i see hickman. Yeah. Uh, yeah oh man there are so many characters it's like hard to keep track of what was going on because i was and i was especially so distracted by charlie hunnam uh he's kind of this like roguish hun solo type character who's in there and he's doing the worst Irish accent I've heard in a long time. It's abysmal. And especially like, right, because I watched <laughs> I watched Wind That Shakes the Barley, which is obviously set in yes. Ireland, so you're hear, hearing these genuine accents. And then the whiplash of going to this is like, oh my God, this is this is embarrassing. Is, is he the guy that said, I'm going to die you to a boast? Because that was one of my notes. <laughs> there was somebody die that said, I'm, I'm going to die you to a boast. It was supposed to be tie you to a post. Oh, I don't even remember that line. The movie. That, was a, that was a line that stuck out for me. <laughs> I'm going to die you to a boat. His most memorable line to me, <laughs> are the, right, spoilers for Rebel Moon. He's oh, like no. a traitor character who like sells them out. But um, like in the scene before he sells them out, he's like being overly nice and like being a good guy. And then he has he literally has a line where he's like, well, I guess that makes me a good guy, huh? And then he like <laughs> shifts it, he moves his eyes around. It's like, wink, wink. this is juvenile writing. This is, cr I couldn't believe like how bad this was. This must've been rushed together in like a weekend. This, this is, it's not even first draft stuff. Well, maybe it's, it is just a leftover script. Maybe it's exactly what he pitched to Lucasfilm fucking 20 years ago. Maybe it's literally what it was. I would not be surprised. But I mean, what is it? With How does he keep getting away with it? Aside from the obvious answer of the, he makes money and gets eyes. But like th this He's is... He's got a very dedicated fan base for some reason. I can't explain that part. And I, I, I understood that <laughs> during while he was attached. When he was anchored to DC, I understood that, you know? There's a baked-in audience there. They love seeing this like dark, edgy version of Cyborg or whatever the hell he was doing. Um, I understand that, but this, his original stuff, like, are they like diehard Sucker Punch fans who are like, I know there exist out there, like, they uh, used to be buried Bob. on Tumblr, though. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, of course, Movie Bob loves that goddamn movie, but uh, yeah. <laughs> this, this is pretty much Sucker Punch level to me, where it just feels like Zack Snyder's, all the things he liked when he was 14, just kind of being referenced with, like, nothing that links it together no cohesion to it and also like a, a tonal inconsistency that tries to balance this self-important heavy tone but also like the goofiness of the sci-fi setting it's like it's artless it's joyless exactly like, it's like he doesn't even like making movies you know it's, it's so weird the reason why they had to redo the dc universe is because the, eventually they realized People want to see fun. <laughs> and Zack Snyder forgot the fun parts of his movies. He's like, no, this is dark and dreary and serious. And like, you, this is art and pretentious bullshit. This, yeah, this big pop cinema. And he's not even that good at filmmaking. Like, he, the lenses in this are terrible. I hate how it's shot. Mm. Oh, yeah. Ugly, ugly, ugly. But yeah, it is, it is kind of missing the forest because... If this was his version of Star Wars and he pitched it as a Star Wars movie, like Star Wars is campy, it's goofy. Oh yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's hopeful. Look at his interpretation of fucking comic books. <laughs> like <laughs> same shit. He's like, what if we did it but not fun? In his mind, he's like, what if it was what if it was super cool? But he must lack a certain level of self awareness because, like, 
I get doing Watchmen. That that tone kind of fits. It's way more kind of like sure. nihilistic, and it's supposed to be like a deconstruction of like superheroes, and it is dark and edgy, and it's a murder. And mystery. it was also like the most violent one at the time. Exactly. Yeah, and it was that was something new. Like it was we, mature. Yeah, exactly, and it's based on one of the most famous graphic novels ever created. Yeah. Um, but yeah, whenever he whenever he pens one of these stories, it's just like it's so juvenile. It's it's basically Bugs Life the story here, you know. Like yes, there's a there's a innocent farmers who are they just be making their grain on their their farming planet. Oh, the hmm. the evil grasshoppers. I mean the empire. I mean the what are they space called Nazis? Here? They call themselves space Nazis. the space Nazis. Thank you. And it's already like it, it in the original Star Wars. It wasn't exactly subtle. You know the no. like imagery they were pulling from, um, but he was like, yeah, "Let's make it even less subtle." That's that's kind of what he's good at, making it to no level of subtlety at all. Like make, strip it yeah. of any subtlety. The the tone insists that it's for adults, but the way it's written makes it seem like it might be for children actually. <laughs> and then he's yeah. doing the whole like so, we're doing an unrated cut. It's gonna be like. Four hours long or some shit. I don't know. Three hours long. Oh, really? He's already oh, yeah. said that. They Well, no, because like, I guess Netflix is in on, you know, the marketing strategy, which was, you know, the Snyder cut of uh, Justice League. That got so much hype. Like, mm. I don't know if there was a more heavily marketed or even heavily successful director's cut of a film being released. And so Netflix is just yeah. like, fuck it, have at it. You, but just make sure that we have a normie cut, a PG-13 cut <laughs> that we can release so long as we can say that there's an R-rated or unrated or extended director's cut coming later. So the way that they're trying to release it, my understanding is they're not going to release the extended cut of part one until part two is out, I think. Until the normal part two All is right. out. right. So we're stuck with the spineless cut. Cool. Leading with the best foot forward, yeah. clearly. There's um, people that exist, <laughs> like unironically, that are just like they're waiting for the the real cut. It's like, well, this one was the real cut because they're working with <laughs> Netflix approved it and greenlit it before they even released this one. So it's not like there's a th this isn't a theatrical cut. This is a streaming service. This is literally just all hype. It's a scam. What do you think this is? It's a scam. Yeah. It's a streaming service. Yeah, it Why feels is it like it. Really, if you have two different cuts of the film for any sort of artistic reason or like, oh, you want to be, have kids be able to see it. The other one's more violent. Release them both at the same time. This is a uh -huh. scam. I hate how people keep defending Snyder of like, oh, no, he's a true artist and a true visionary. And the anytime you see anything bad was like Joss Whedon's fault or like Warner Brothers fault or yeah. whoever he's wearing. It's never his fault. And then you see him without any shackles, I mean, ostensibly, allegedly, debatably. And he still makes shit movies, you know, like there was no. What, it's been it has been so long. Army of the Dead was released in an unacceptable condition. That was unacceptable. Yeah, yeah it was embarrassing. It was embarrassing, but popular. But it's, we're at a point with Zack Snyder now where it's like, why? Like, why did we? Why did anyone ever have any belief in him as a filmmaker? Like it sounds harsh, but it's like this film is is embarrassing, and it is like it's inept in ways where it's like, how can you be this many films deep? He's got what like twenty six credits on his IMDb as director. How can you be this deep and still be doing the exact same shit you've been doing, man? Since you started falling apart with Sucker Punch, you know, and that was what twenty eleven. <laughs> it's over a decade. And all yeah. the films in between that, it's like, it's just getting worse and worse and worse. And I don't know, it, it might even be worse than Army of the Dead. And I thought that was a boring waste of time with like a similar problem of like combining all of these random elements of like superhero zombies and uh, this heist and all this random imagery and references to things. And it's the same thing here. It's like, why you close your eyes for five minutes and open them and suddenly it's like the Dark Souls movie. There's like a spider monster and... The, the the Asian woman character like looks like she's from Bloodborne, and then you close yeah. your eyes again and open it, and then you're in a Roman Colosseum. And I was like, what? Do, 
What like what is the cohesion to this world? None, none, like, it, none whatsoever. Because <laughs> it really makes me appreciate Star Wars more for that, for making that work. Like it really sells an aesthetic with how crazy it is, and it well, feels like it is one thing. They have all these fucking ideas that they're just like trying to throw at the wall, which none of them are original. Every single one of them derivative, but they're pulling a whole like I yeah. don't know. Or am I going to say the word Valerian again? I'm not sure. Where it's something along those lines, <laughs> right? <laughs> And the way that they justify that is with the most fucking lazy, boring way of 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 excusing all of these things that don't fit together. And he's like, I'm uh -huh. they're like, I'm assembling a team. The bad guys come in it and they're going to do bad things. So I got to yeah, assemble like a team. So they, yeah. So they go to all the different. They go to Hicksville. <laughs> right. They go to Hickland and meet Hickman and they're wrangling. And then they go to the other spot, and the, we see Simon. Like, yeah, Conan Dujo, the Barbarians there. Yeah. However, you, I don't remember what his name is. And so it's just like that that justify, or that's their attempt at justifying the fact that there is no cohesion between any of the ideas or set pieces that they have. And it's just lazy. Yeah. It's absolutely lazy. It's derivative. It's nothing. It's like, well, you you ripped off other things, and you didn't do anything nearly as good or competent as those other things. The only difference is there's slow motion in some scenes. Yeah. You just, you just really yeah. love slow-mo. Still. That's about it. Still, And that, that's such like a tired joke as well, but it like is still true, you know? He still thinks it's the coolest <laughs> like, thing ever. He still thinks it's, it's the coolest, most original thing. I mean, there's a chunk of people that really do. Yeah, you're right. Um, but like this is it's kind of like the plot of Mass Effect 2 in a way, you know? So you're assembling a team for an impossible mission. And the, the fun is supposed to be like these small characters, well, all these, the characterization of putting this team together and the, the dynamics between these characters. But like in the two hours and 20 minutes you have, each time they introduce a new element, they abandon the previous thing. Like the, the, uh, the one good scene I'll give this movie, it has one. It has a good scene. And that's the, yeah, it has one, I would say. <laughs> and even then it's ruined by certain things, yeah, which I'll mention me. in a okay. second, but it's, uh, <laughs> They introduce in the beginning this character that seems like he's going to be like a big deal to the movie. This Anthony Hopkins robot, right? Yeah. Who's like, and they, they go into all this lore of like, oh, there's 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 a whole like Dune. There are like royal families, and one day there was like a a, a royal uh, princess or whatever who died, and when she died, then all the robots suddenly refused to fight anymore. So they're all like pacifists now. Mm -hmm. Um. And there's a scene where Anthony Hopkins' robot get it's a really awful scene before it, where uh, the the villainous characters like they shoot at the robot, and he gets all like covered in mud, and he has to go wash himself by a river, or whatever. Um, and yeah, it's heavy-handed and goofy, and kind of like the Jesus imagery thing that he's always doing. Um, yeah, <laughs> but that was like the, the the one scene I thought was yeah, like that's why people like him so much. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Um, I was like, okay, this I kind of like this robot. Anthony Hopkins, he's got like a cool delivery with his voice. This, the, I thought the effects sure, actually yeah. looked a lot better in that scene when it was in the water and he was like, sh there's clearly like some mocap and a lot of cool effects going on there. There's like a good shot from underneath the bridge with a nice reflection, yeah. well framed. It's like the one shot in the whole film, and I was, and it makes you think, well, this guy, this seems to be like a core cool character to this. He's going to have something to do or no. say, and then that's just <laughs> abandoned. And then it goes to yeah. Yeah, the the Colosseum to the blah blah blah. I'm not even convinced they'll have a major role in the sequel. I think like they almost teased it. I'm like I'm not even convinced that we'll get that. Yeah, maybe he's filling up the entire like missing forty minutes of the alternate cut. Maybe there's an entire B story that <laughs> yeah. we have missed. Uh, probably, probably right? yeah, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, because when he shows up, he shows up for like one shot at the end, and this time he's like, he's got like a staff, and he's got like deer antlers attached to his head and stuff. So yeah. what's going on here? What is going on? There was probably an interesting story <laughs> we didn't see. Yeah, yeah. Well, I thought the structure was really going to be more of a kind of cutting back and forth to the like home planet, um, showing the state of like the oppression and have some tension to this place that they're supposed to be defending that's supposed to be like the their homeland that they're all fighting for but it's really just abandoned for the whole movie and because they set it up as like yeah the 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 mothership or whatever that is 
that the oppressors come down from is there. The the Nazi officer guy comes down and is like, you have you have nine weeks to bring us grain because our super advanced <laughs> yeah we hyper, don't know agriculture all across the well. galaxy yeah we don't know agriculture <laughs> we can bring people back from the dead we've got that technology uh, we've got we've got whole planets dedicated to cobalt mining and all of this sort of thing but we can't we can't farm grain um, no it's an ancient wisdom. <laughs> these are the basic these are the basic of basic stakes so you so you're thinking oh so they're gonna have to they have nine weeks to prepare something to prepare an army so when they're back there'll be some kind of fight or whatever but it doesn't go that way at all because then there's this kind of weird like attempted rape scene with all the soldiers and it turns into this really awfully choreographed lame fight scene with a main character uh is is killing all the soldiers with an axe and uh, it cuts every time. She pones them. <laughs> she does pwn you know, them. It's in slow mo, so it's really cool. Yeah. Slow mo, and there's no blood. And again, just the tonal thing of like, see, you can't show the violence, but you're having the framing of this be something as extreme as that. Yeah. Um. Okay. And that's another recurring thing in loads of his movies. He loves. He loved that in Sucker Punch as well. It's like the only thing he knows how to write villains. Mm -hmm. like as, as their motivation or whatever um so then after that all the soldiers are killed that were kind of occupying this farmland and instead of the the empire i'm just going to call them the empire fuck it it's sure too you can call them whatever you want the <laughs> so instead of the empire like i guess they didn't know that all the soldiers that they deployed there were killed and didn't immediately just glass it from space and just take it um mm. they just kind of wait around and just <laughs> i guess they just don't care about that um no or uh and that, that there are so many points in the world build, building that contradicts itself because the main character it's revealed at a certain point used to be like with the empire and she was like high up in the empire and she was trained by a high up guy in it the the big bad guy so mm. she's a really good fighter and all of this and all that and she knows that they're here for everything. They're gonna, they're gonna decimate every, and take everything. <laughs> that was a literal quote. <laughs> what are they gonna do? Yeah, exactly. What are they gonna take? What do they want? Everything. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and then he repeats it as well. When, oh, they uh, want everything. When the villain guy comes down. <laughs> um, oh yeah, I do want everything actually. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then in the flashback later, she describes how when they plunder, they don't even ask for anything they just take it just for the thrill of the chase i guess just for the thrill of plundering like vikings or something mm. so then you're wondering wait so why didn't they just do that earlier anyway to the yeah. farmers like n none of this makes any sense <laughs> like as far as like building tensions or establishing universe well you needed the speech yeah it's all man, th this is like how to not do world building it's it's actually horrendous like the aesthetics and all of it, it all clashes a lot of telling and not showing i noticed a lot of uh mm -hmm. huge heavy exposition dumps that were very boring visually this movie it's kind of sad when you're pretending to do this whole expansive world and universe and especially especially when you're showing so many different planets and settings and throughout the entire yeah. film, I don't believe a single one of them. Like none of them are convincing in terms no. of how they're presented visually, in terms of in terms of believing that the characters are in the universe and the actors are in the scene, and then just believing that the universe exists. Like it, there's no, like you said, there's no cohesion to it. It doesn't feel convincing in any way. It really just feels like green screen Mandalorian room. The movie. <laughs> Well, yeah, I don't think there's anything that looks as good as the Mandalorian in this. Um, oh, it really is embarrassing. Like the, yeah. the, everything looks like grease is smeared over the lens. Oh, yeah, it, it's bizarre. I don't know if that's a budgetary thing or a stylistic thing. No, he, he was just it's it was literally just fucking out of focus for like half the movie. He's using shit lenses. <laughs> Like the the choice of lens, I don't know what what the hell he was thinking. And he about was the, DP, wasn't he? Of course he was. He was for the last fucking <laughs> movie where there was dead pixels all over the fucking screen. 
Like, he, the guy's a fucking incompetent idiot. <laughs> like, I don't, Is this a yes man problem? Like, I don't know. I don't know. Like, He's got uh, fans, crazy. though. <laughs> so, like, <laughs> he, he boasts... Oh, my God. L- listening to him behind the scenes about talking, like, just... Oh, yeah, you know, I've got a very strong visual style, like... Like he's all of this was intentional. All of this was intentional. You look at some, like some of the bridge shots early in the movie, like around thirteen minutes. I time stamped in my notes. Mm-hmm. They're just out of focus. Like what entire wide shots that are like completely yeah. out of focus. And there are multiple, when they're out of there focus, are with, times. Oh, it's all throughout the movie. It's all throughout the movie. And yeah. when the yeah. things are out of focus, you're absolutely right with how it looks like shit smeared on the screen. I wrote one of my notes is. I felt like it looked like watching a 3D movie without the 3D glasses. Yeah. Is that's how yeah, it felt like to me? It. <laughs> it's just yeah. it looks terrible. It looks genuinely terrible. And like maybe I kind of got used to it over the course of the film, but damn, I don't know what you were thinking. It's the, what the fuck is wrong with you? Yeah, I I was like genuinely considering like cuz the number that's being floated around for the budget of both parts is about 166 million right now. So if you halve that, maybe you're trying to hide some of the visual effects. <laughs> I don't know what the thinking was behind that, but um, I don't know. It goes beyond that, though. Like you could forgive visual effects at a certain level if, like, there was some charisma to it. You know, some original ideas, some good dialogue, some characters that were fun. None of it. The <laughs> the lead character is so unlikable and like. All the characters are. All the, no one could sell this dialogue. But they're so cool, <laughs> though. Don't you think they're cool, though? That's what's so... It's so... Everything just reads like what like a 14-year-old finds cool, you know? Like the whole, the whole gang coming together, right? Like you imagine in something like Mass Effect, it's people of all different ages, all these different aliens. They've all got completely different slices of life. But then like in this movie, they're all just like ripped cool action people like one of the characters for example is supposed to be this it's like a defamed general he's he's in the coliseum and he's like washed up and he's he's drinking or whatever and he's got his beard is all long and he doesn't know what he's doing um and that would be a cool character if like maybe he was you know he was past his prime but like deep down in there there's like this knowledge of this general in there and that's what's valuable about him like that that knowledge that strategy or whatever but no, he's just like a ripped, just like action figure, just action man. Mm-hmm. So they, they don't know how to, he doesn't know how to characterize. Like it's so weak. No. Everyone, everyone just says exactly like what's on their mind the second they come up with it. And they're always like repeating dialogue and phrases in these very particular ways. And, and speaking of the word very, that was the thing I kind of was alluding to earlier with the Anthony Hopkins character. He, um, he has a line. Our very joy died with that young girl. And that stood out to me because mere minutes before, there was also a line from the main character who also said, the very idea of love was beaten out of me. Which stood out to me because it's just like, what? why is everyone speaking the same way? The very idea oh, of love. Oh, yeah. Our very joy. It's like, wow. Right. <laughs> it's like, oh. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like writing 101. You know, you see, you see words you're like repeating and be like, oh, yeah, that looks kind of awkward that I've repeated that specific phrase or that had, had different characters speak in the exact same way. But it's like not even picked up. It's not even minutes apart. I, I just don't know how you wouldn't pick this up when I'm like watching it or writing it. And it's like, there are three writers credited. You know, it's like, there's no excuse. Because at a certain point, it is like, there is an opportunity cost to all this. There's a lot of like man hour, a lot of like manpower that's gone into this film. A lot of like arms, a lot of resources that have been sunk into this. And it's like, for what? Well, you look at the success of something like Star Wars and you think, I want all of that success. <laughs> And then that's that's the whole motivation. Even they can't do it. You, well, you look at it and you're like, okay, merchandising, right? We're gonna want people to dress up like the, there. People are gonna want to buy the light swords that are not, not lightsabers. <laughs> like, I, I don't know. People are gonna want a yeah, little. Yeah, what could act, you even merchandise from this? Fucking uh, Funko Pops of Anthony Hopkins robot. <laughs> I don't know. 
Like, if it's successful enough, then people will just want to, like, ah, oh, it'll become a pop culture thing. Like, I think, I don't know, he probably wants fucking 10 Netflix spinoff shows. He wants to see the same success that Disney Plus had with his other shit. Like, I don't know. Why the fuck else would you make a Star Wars clone? Clearly, you don't care about the story if you're just being derivative and ripping off other things. Like, you're not telling mm-hmm. something from your soul that you wanted to express. There wasn't something that you had to get out. Like, oh, I just needed to tell this story. No, you didn't do that. So it seems to be purely just a money thing. It goes beyond being bad. into Like, it, it's really cringy. Like, it, yeah. it's actually <laughs> embarrassingly cringy. It, um, yeah. Like, when they show the flag of the, the Empire or whatever, it's got, like, the Illuminati eye in the middle. It's like, why do you think that's cool? You know, like <laughs> n- none of this is cool imagery. This is like incredibly lame. It's, it goes hand in hand with Sucker Punch. It's on that level of like, <laughs> this sucks. Yeah. Like this actually is fucking embarrassing. Well, what's <laughs> funny is, um, so I did a little browse through his IMDb just now. He mostly works with existing IPs. And Sucker Punch is yeah. like one of his only not based off of another IP movies and then army of the dead and then rebel moon and it's like okay well army of the dead is just you might as well i i don't even know did they pay licensing to like fucking george a romero or whoever owns like dawn of the dead because that seems like just such a similar title you'd like you'd have to pay royalties or have to i don't know yeah that does seem and then this is a star wars clone and then i guess sucker punch is like the most original movie he's ever made Original in quotes, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, like, the least yeah, derivative. Was was Legends of the Guardians based on it something? It was based on something, I checked. Is that, like, a book or something? I guess it's a book. Oh, okay. That's the, that's the one I haven't seen. Um, I remember liking it outside of one very bad musical segment scene. A bad musical segment? Well, they, okay, so here's, film? okay, spoilers for <laughs> Legends of the Guardians, the Owls of Gahul. <laughs> um so they decide cuz it's it's orbiting this weird uh place between Zack Snyder film and kids movie and so mm. you know there's cool animation and slow-mo f- fight sequences that I thought worked for like you know f- owl characters flying around and shit it's like okay that some good fight sequences in here and I liked the kind of serious tone and then in the middle of the fucking movie they're like, oh, well, we're going to fly over to this place. And you have this transitionary scene. And what song do they fucking play? They play fucking Owl City song. <laughs> like, <laughs> no, they, couldn't hel- they couldn't fucking help themselves. They played Owl City in the Owl movie for obvious reasons. Yeah, I don't remember if it was Fireflies or a different one. sounds like you're making it up. <laughs> no, it sounds like I'm making it up. That's the, that's the scene that stuck out to me the most. And I Holy could not fuck, that's tell hilarious. you much else about the film because that I watched it in a theater <laughs> and I was like, you pieces of shit. You <laughs> absolute pieces of shit. I'm sure you could find the scene on wow. YouTube if you wanted. That's hilarious. Oh my god. I know I uh. just I couldn't believe it. <laughs> and it's it doesn't fit with the rest of the movie at all. Like the tone or anything. I'm seeing here a bunch of um He's directed a bunch of Morrissey music videos too, which oh. uh, it's all starting to make sense to me now. That's kind of funny. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, back to Rebel Moon. Like, what's something that actually happened? Apart from the space Belfast, it being Harry Potter randomly, Conan flying a griffin, Dark Souls spider, lightsabers. Oh, yeah, there was a Dark Souls spider. Gladiator arena. There's like a... Yeah. yeah. Just straight up that spider from Dark Souls, pretty much. That was a thing that happened. Yeah, well, it just does that. Like, it just establishes something. It's like, no, no, we actually don't want to do that. We're just going to go somewhere else now and just do something completely unrelated. (laughs) And there's no resistance. So I was, like, checked out of the movie pretty quickly because, you know. (laughs) Yeah, of course. What is there to attach yourself to? (laughs) But I made it. I'm always coming. I'm like the MacGyver of finding ways to make me not minecraft while watching a movie (laughs) yeah so i just started doing like vine boom sound effects whenever they said like a line they deliver a line be like i'm gonna die you to a boast and i just play it on my phone like (laughs) just like a big 
damn, it didn't even play from my phone. I was hoping to just do that in front of the microphone. Have to add uh, it in post. What the fuck is wrong with my phone? It's been doing. Oh, dude. there we go. That's oh, what happened. Yeah. <laughs> nice. All right. Sorry. Yeah, that might as well have been in the movie with like how like melodramatic and uh, over it, the top yeah. everything is. Like uh, just unself aware it is, you know. And some of the actors, like I've seen them deliver good performances before. Like the fella from Game of Thrones, uh, Michael Huseman. He's kind of like it's revealed. I get, it, it's almost presented like a twist that he's like the love interest for the main character. Someone just comes up behind him and just goes, I know you're in love. Yeah, it's the, it's the Irish guy, the Charlie Hunnam character. It's mm. like, I know you love the main character, don't you? And that's supposed to be like, a, yeah, as an audience mem- as audience members, we know. We've, we've been seeing that, that chemistry build and there's clearly something between them. But you're more just like, what? what? I didn't pick up that at all. <laughs> I, that was not no. how I read that one bit. No, I mean, from the very beginning of the fucking movie, the soundtrack was just insisting so much without anything having happened. Yeah. Like she's just in the field, like fucking doing nothing. And the music yeah. is insisting, like, there was some sort of grand reveal mm-hmm. or like there is something built up to this. Or I'm like, what am I, what am I, what am I supposed to be feeling right now? I don't understand. Yeah. It presents itself with such gravitas that's just not earned. Not earned. It's, at all. It's, it's obviously trying to channel, you know, the Luke Skywalker. In the desert, looking up at the two suns, you know, type thing. Oh, yeah. It thinks it's just epic by showing the set that doesn't even look convincing. Yeah. Yeah. The film from the 60s looks better than it. It thinks it's being so epic. Yeah. It's embarrassing. It's embarrassing. And then, as you said earlier, the the whole, like, the the saying instead of showing type stuff, um, that gladiator character who gets no development and is just like, that's most of the characters. There's too many characters and none of them get anything to do. So then, like, when the villain confronts him towards the end and he's going through one by one after they've been ambushed and they're all in these weird bounty hunter machines that like can disable you, your spine um oh, yeah. <laughs> he has a line where he like <laughs> he looks at the gladiator character and is like ah yes your actions at the battle of serawu precede you i said like, what the fuck are you talking about what are you actually talking about you never showed that you just you just say you're just saying that i guess that's for part two that's part two, yeah. It's extended cut. <laughs> you got um, you got to go back to Netflix and watch an even longer version of the same movie to get the full experience. And, and they're they're talking the whole time about like the resistance. There's the resistance out there, the rebels. The rebels are out there somewhere, and they, you eventually get to meet them. R- Ray Fisher is comes back. A cyborg is there. And they're like acting like this is huge character. He's he's like a big deal. And then literally in the next scene, he sacrifices himself, and they're acting like it's a big deal. It's like I just met this guy. Why would I? Why would I care that he's sacrificing himself and taking down this big mothership? Like, why are you giving it to that character? Because it's important. <laughs> the music is saying that. Yeah, it insists it's important. I'm done talking and about this that, shit. I just mentioned I, those, I'm getting bored. I just mentioned those. I've got like two little things left. Look. <laughs> okay. I mentioned those bounty hunter machines. They're, they're these weird, like, they're like boxes and they unfold into these, like, they look like robots, robot spines that, like, pick people up for, like, bounty hunters to bring people in. They, they dedicate this whole scene to showing them off and how they, they like, kill people. But then the next time it's used, these same machines or explained to just disable people. And it's just like, God, you can't even keep it straight, like, within five minutes of yourself, you know? I like how how the villain survived for no reason at the end. Yeah, he's, like, reborn. absolutely no reason. There was a real, like, Matrix kind of ending. Mm. The Matrix. But really, what part of this insisted the need for two parts? None. Absolutely none. Same part that justified Genuinely there being none. a fucking director's cut. They don't care. Netflix, okay, I've said this before. I'm pretty sure streaming services just want as much content as possible in length. Yeah. Just so just that you're minutes. constantly having something to finish so that you stay subscribed longer. It's a subscription service. That would be the strat is just making things really long so that people always have something unfinished. As soon as people run out of things to watch on on your platform, then people 
won't click on it. And as far as yeah. I'm aware, like this is a successful film <laughs> that many people watch. <laughs> yeah, what is the, what is the metric of success? I have no like, idea what, what the metric of success is. I don't know if Netflix lies about their Watch numbers. Minutes. I can tell you that the trailer has fucking sixteen million views. That's not bad. But like, how many how many people are well, doing that yeah. just to like clown on Snyder? Also, like, if I mm-hmm. click on this, is it going to be a bunch of un- unironic comments in the comment section? Yeah, that's what but I'm it doesn't seeing. Si- unlike the Snyder cut, though, like it, people don't really like it. You know. Like, like the ratings aren't like... good, the oh. critical reviews aren't good. Like, people love the Snyder Cut, man. It's got like over a seven, I think, really? on uh, like an oh. IMDb, for example. <laughs> yeah, tons of ratings. Yeah. Whereas this is sitting at a 5.6 from 88K ratings right now, um, which even that is generous. Wow, that's got a 7.9. <laughs> exactly, yeah. That's what I'm saying. Like that, That's different. But I think that's the DC bump because it's just like characters people know and are attached to already whereas like outside of outside of that one character that you'd noted down give, give me a name of one of these characters so other than hickman <laughs> aside from hickman I have, i've got nothing you know i don't have anything <laughs> yeah, i wrote yeah, it down because like... it was a funny name <laughs> i don't remember the other names oh wait i just saw that the anthony hopkins character is called jimmy that's quite oh. funny <laughs> Cool. <laughs> okay. <laughs> nice one. Uh but yeah, I think I think that's most of what I have to say. Th- this is a this is abysmal. Like the, I thought it looked bad already. I thought it looked pretty shocking from the trailers and whatnot, but actually watching it is just like this is this is writing so inept. It is one of those examples like Suicide Squad, like Valerian, where it's like, yeah, make all the inverse choices and you would have a pretty good movie probably. It's like that level of bad, you know. Yeah, this I would give this a half star. I hate this film. Like, I actually think this is so embarrassing um, for Snyder. And, and there's no excuse because it's like, do you know how many people would be clawing for the opportunity to get their story out there? Their 166 million for their four hours, probably four and a half hours if they're both like two hours 20. We don't want to think to of get their story better out uses for this money. That's too depressing. <laughs> no, that's <laughs> we that, don't exactly. Wanna, yeah, that, we don't but that, think that. it gets to a point where it's like this is comical. How much money are you giving him to make this? It's it's no, nah, it gets under my skin. It's not it's an artist. People like him. It's too much. It's too much. It's your, it's his job is to be a storyteller, but the storytelling is inept, like actually inept. You know, it's funny. Genuinely I think the, inept. I think the uh, the difference between. Uh, the amount of people that watched this versus the amount of people that liked it. I think it's probably because a big marketing budget, uh, Netflix had, you know, posters for these everywhere and like airports and stadiums and, you know, pretty sure they had it like on a UFC on the UFC mat and shit. Like they were paying Mm -hmm. for people to see it front page of Netflix. As soon as it opens up, like big things, rebel moon, big poster. And I think the average person is going to look at that and think, Oh, the new star Wars. And think that maybe they have to watch it to be a part of a cultural conversation. And maybe if they don't think it's exactly Star Wars, maybe something subconscious in someone's brain makes you feel like you have to watch it to like be a part of something. The fact that it says part one, um, yeah. I think, also helps. I think if it didn't mm-hmm. say part one, less people would have watched it. Because it's like, you look at that, like, oh, they obviously spend a lot of money on this and then it's a part one, like, oh, they've really... Yeah. They really put their faith in this. Like, then you kind of feel obligated to watch it. And I guess some evidence in your favor for that is, like, um, that huge Star Wars channel, Star Wars Theory. Mm. Like, I remember when this when this film came out, he did, like, a big stream and a big, like, hoopla about this movie. Like, yeah, the real Star Wars is here. Let's go. Oh, really? <laughs> And then, like, no one mentions it again, yeah. <laughs> a Star Wars channel did that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you serious? I'm serious, yeah, Star That's Wars crazy. Theory. I mean, he, he was hyped about this, yeah, yeah. That sounds like you were making um, that up for a joke. But, <laughs> no, I'm serious. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's beyond parody at this point. His films are beyond parodies of themselves. It's it's crazy. It's like what someone would make if you wanted to, like, make fun of Zack Snyder. Yeah. Like, There's no way he'd make something that bad, you know? Yeah. But it's like, nope. That's actually the point we're at. That's unfortunate because I don't know. He's I, I find him quite likable in some of these <laughs> things I've seen with him. Like I, I saw this clip of him at a, a stand up show. He was like randomly in the crowd and like he was like singled out by the audience by happenstance. And hmm. 
I don't know. I've seen some like just charming clips of him, but I just I just hate oh, yeah. his films. <laughs> I just think <laughs> I doubt from what I've seen, like he doesn't seem like a bad person. He just makes no, no, very he's, yeah, bad he seems movies like quite the inverse. <laughs> and he has awful films. One of yeah. the worst fan bases, maybe. <laughs> like for a director, like pretty high up there, actually. Can you think of a director with a worse fan base? Because like most of the bad fan bases are just like oh Marvel or DC, but like this is a, this is like yeah. the director himself has absorbed the DC fan base, the cultish sort of yeah yeah. I, I don't think I can think of one on that level. People don't people yeah they normally attach themselves to the property more yeah than that you know. But they're kind like of just like dedicated. Like George Lucas, now. it's Star Wars. Yeah, but was that Snyder? Zaddy. Is the Snyder side. Well, I enjoyed this a little bit more than Army of the Dead, but that's a, not a very high bar. Army of the Dead's like one of the worst no. things I've ever seen. Uh, I gave this a 2 out of 10. <laughs> Rebel Moon, I gave it a 2 out of 10. Uh, it could be because I was watching the correct version of the film. So <laughs> consider that. Um, fuck this <laughs> movie and fuck Netflix. That is correct. It's one of those things where... Uh, People people talk about how Netflix is like, oh, Netflix has gone to shit. They don't have good content anymore, blah, 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 blah. And I mean, like, yeah, their original programming has gone downhill, but it's because people watch it. It's because people are fucking clicking on this yeah. shit. It gets engagement, yeah. Exactly. Like, you look at all the dumb-ass reality TV shit that they produce. Mm -hmm. Guess what? People in America are watching it. This is the most popular streaming service. People are clicking yeah. on this shit. They're doing what gets clicks, so I, I you can't blame them business wise. It's it's quite a contrast to back in the day where they like really had to prove themselves with something like House of Cards, and watching that was like, wow, you know, they got Fincher in here. Yeah, shows the... that people talked <laughs> about versus shows that like people just put on because they're tired at the end of the day and don't actually want to engage with something. <laughs> yeah, like just things to yeah, fall asleep to, to is the the cornered market yeah. they got now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, I mean, this was a very sleepy movie. This was a sleepy baby movie. Oh, incredibly sleepy. Well, I literally fell asleep the first time. So yeah, actually, it's it's a good sleep aid. Yeah. So yeah. maybe I need to bump it up the score for that sleep Damn, aid. Actually, Nature yeah. Bit, but... <laughs> ASMR, nah, zaddy nah, sounds <laughs> to fall asleep too. Ooh, there will be a three-hour version. It'll be perfect when that comes out. Oh, that's yeah, that is perfect. Perfect Beautiful. ultimate sleep aid. Yeah. Better movie we watched. <laughs> uh, Four Things. <laughs> the new Yorgos Lanthimos film. We might have talked about it yeah. earlier, but they released it in the UK later than everyone for some reason. Or later than other Western countries. Yeah, last countries. Friday it came out here. Um, don't know why. Spoiler alert for this film. We're going to spoil the shit out of it. We both recommend it. I don't even have to ask you, Alex. I know you're right. Like, of course, this is a great movie. You're not going to tell me that like, it sucked or anything, right? No, I adored it. I, I absolutely <laughs> adored it. It's probably it's probably my number one from 2022 right I was now. thinking... I was Sorry, thinking 23. Probably, yeah, for myself as well. Why did I say 22? I don't know. Yeah, it's my number one right now. Um, yeah, man. What like a demented, fun film. It's crazy. It's so crazy. sick. Yeah. 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 Um, with a lot of backbone, like when I when I left the uh, when I left the screening, I, I said to the person that I saw it with, um, "That's my Barbie right there." <laughs> Not that I didn't like Barbie, mm -hmm. but like its underlying themes and what it was going for, like that message uh, wrapped up There's with some this aesthetic and this writing. That's what I'm after. I loved. I don't even know where to begin. I guess the production design is like a good place to start because, like, just from the from the word go with this film, with the marketing, like, I haven't seen posters this good in a long time. But I love the posters for this film, um, and that leans into the the, the yeah, overall production. Yeah, Lanthimos is always great. He does have with very the, good posters, actually. Yeah, the type of style he wants to communicate with uh, his posters. They always they're always very intriguing. They're always like. I wonder what this is about. Yeah. This looks interesting and different. And yeah. yeah, while I enjoyed the the kind of period piece nature of the favorite, I guess I, I wasn't expecting the the kind of fantasy almost like almost like Bioshock Infinite at points. Mm -hmm. Like the saturated colors, like crazy elseworld 
Frankenstein thing it was going for. Yeah, in combination with the like fisheye type lenses and almost kind of like those vignette things. Yeah, I loved the the use of the fisheye because I because you bring up uh, the favorite. That was one of my minor criticisms with the favorite, and I've only seen it once. Maybe I won't feel like it's as much of a criticism, but there's like two or three shots in the favorite that are kind of like fisheye lens uh, pivot pan shots or whatever. And they feel yeah. kind of out of place because not only is it a period film where you, you don't necessarily want to be thinking about the camera and lens, mm -hmm. but the rest of the film, the style didn't like it wasn't that extreme. So when it the few moments that were extreme in in uh, the favorite kind of just stood out, and I was like, okay, I, I was just reminded I was watching a movie not as cohesive as it could have been. I love that movie, but poor things mm -hmm. they turned it up to a fucking eleven where all throughout the film, the use of lenses and the angles and th the visual style of it is so fucking extreme that it fits. Mm. And despite this also being it's so a like, maximalist, piece, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it all works really well, especially with the story that they're telling, especially with the tone, especially with the soundtrack. Like, every element of this fits like a puzzle piece, and it complements itself. Uh absolutely perfectly yeah and j j I, I just love those like weird quirky fancy elements like the it even gets a little bit steampunk at points with like that weird mm -hmm. horse and carriage with the oh yeah that willem defoe's character makes because it is the, the general plot i guess is the it's kind of like a spin on frankenstein with this this whole as I said, demented idea of a, a pregnant woman who commits suicide in this Frankenstein type character, retrieves her body, takes the brain of the baby from inside her and puts it into the grown woman's head. And uh, yeah, so you have this whole journey of this juvenile, fully grown woman kind of creepiness and mm. her eventually kind of gaining agency. And uh, I kind of read it as like a, I mean, it's not really hiding it, but the. The, the whole like infantilizing angle where uh true all these people are like taking advantage of her and uh that i love there's there's a line where um the mark ruffalo character who is this kind of fop who whisks her away from the the frankenstein castle type setting and takes her traveling all around the world um he starts liking her less the more intelligent she becomes and the the, the, true. the better vocabulary becomes and yeah, he likes her most when she has the literal brain of a child, like a literal brain of a child, yeah, baby which is brain. quite a funny. Um, He's yeah, pedophile. Yeah, and I thought, <laughs> <laughs> basically, <Literally>. and I, <laughs> and I really thought, I thought for Emma Stone that is she must have had belief in this project because man, <laughs> this this quite a bold, and I know bold is quite like an overused term when talking about films, but like. You have to believe a role like this to be able to sell it, because uh, <laughs> if this didn't come together, it could be like it's embarrassing. For, it could be uh, a career uh, ender for some people. Yeah, exactly. Like, this is this is a very controversial subject. You know, baby brain becomes a nympho. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, <it's> like, like, <laughs> and it shows a lot of it too. Uh, mm -hmm. That's a lot of it. And and at the same time, by the way, a very feminist movie, but I could see pissing mm -hmm. some people off uh, that may or may not be feminist. Yeah, it would definitely be a fun one to watch with the whole family. Make yeah, sure you I'm glad I didn't see it with Make my sure mom. You got... I think she would have got upset. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. It's ex it is extremely uh, explicit, but that's it's the whole point. It, sex, sex and sexuality is so deeply baked in um, and explored very thoroughly through the fop character, through the whole section where in Paris with the the whorehouse and everything, and uh, mm -hmm. and yeah, they really they really do explore that side of it. Um, and it has a very unpredictable structure in that sense. Like I, I really did think most of the film was going to be set more in the Frankenstein type castle. Yeah. And, and being more about her escaping, but it's like, oh no, she's whisked away almost instantly. Yeah. And then the cutting back with with the like new <laughs> Emma Stone like replacement is like really funny. I thought I thought this was hilarious, like genuinely funny, um, like really good comedy writing. Oh, it's um, great. I yeah, I was 
I was transfixed the entire time. I was never, never at any point having to, uh, having to pay attention to the movie. The movie commanded my attention. It was just absolute joy to watch. I'm, I'm curious how your audience reacted because like a lot of the time I was the only one laughing and I was in a packed theater and I made uh, some people were complaining after the uh, Killers of the Flower Moon discussion they're like why is Alex always going to these scuffed cinemas where like the, there's like a focus and it's all like garbage but I made I, I went out my way to go to like one of these nice cinemas with the sofas <laughs> and everything so like Tivoli or whatever I'm like this is gonna yeah this is gonna be the proper crowd for a film like this they're gonna be they're going to be in, but I, and I don't know if they were expecting something else or they didn't realize it was a, like a Lanthimos type thing. Cause it, it wasn't surprising to me on that level, knowing what his films are like, but man, yeah. people just weren't really reacting. <laughs> it was quite weird. Cause I thought it was hilarious. Do you, well, do you think that they like, didn't like it by the end of it? Cause I, I brought a couple people to the movie. There were theater wasn't packed or anything. I found myself to be laughing maybe the only person laughing out loud at the film. And I generally don't because I don't find many things funny, <laughs> Yeah, but I loved freaks, the <laughs> morbid, intense humor. And I love how it didn't hold back and how it was risk taking, et cetera, et cetera. Like this is my type of thing. I, and I think maybe we're both just kind of like so jaded and <laughs> used to <laughs> a lot of other yeah. types of things that we really connect with the more extreme and especially particularly well done uh extreme yeah. comedy like disturbing awkward uh vulgar and uh like just shocking it's in service of something though it's not it's not just yeah it's yeah. not just being shock comedy for the sake of it though it is all feeling no exactly exactly it's exploring something and the central character is so compelling and here's the thing the people i went with loved it they thought it was incredible. So it's not like good. Yeah. I'm, I, so I, and, and looking at like the IMDb ratings, like everybody who sees it seems to be loving it. And I don't know if it's just the right people are seeing it. Like surely, surely this has got to get somewhat into the mainstream. I well, guess. that's, that's why I asked. Cause I, I, I never know with, especially with British audiences, we're very, uh, fascist. What's the best word for it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll get into that in the wind that shakes the barley discussion. But uh, <laughs> jump up again a little. Um, we uh, we're quite introverted. We're quite I don't know. We keep ourselves to ourselves. I don't know if <laughs> maybe they were finding it hilarious, but just weren't expressing it. They were just keeping it all internal or something. But uh, that was quite weird. But like uh, like the dance scene and stuff. Is, there's quite a lot of like slapstick kind of humor and like physical yeah. humor um as well damn like, i wish uh, this movie was at tiff i feel like that would have been the perfect crowd yeah Packed oh, theater man, at TIFF. Yeah. it really would have been great that would have been that would be fantastic yeah we wouldn't have been the only people laughing yeah i don't know why it wasn't there actually um yeah just different movies sometimes get different film festivals this one went to venice and venice was taking place like i think during tiff too so there was probably yeah a... i'm pretty sure poor things was at bfi actually but i didn't oh. make it there this year yeah um yeah. Yeah. yeah, I want to point out the uh, the soundtrack. This is the uh, yeah yeah. First, I wanted to hear you talk about this. This is the first film that this composer has scored. They've and they've done other things too. They scored like a play, some sort of like live theater thing, and mm. uh, they had a couple other things on their Wikipedia. I forget, but this is the first film that they've scored. I find it incredible that Yorgos just you know not just composers but like everybody that he works with he always man manages to find the most talented people and the most fitting people for the project like yeah immediately as soon as the the first bits of the score like the actual theme started playing and it was synced to emma stone's character like hitting the table basically the mm -hmm. first like three or four hits were in sync with the first three or four plucks of that piece of the soundtrack. Yeah. And it created what I considered to be a new sound that I ha hadn't heard before. Like even ignoring like the, you know, smashing the, the table sort of thing, the mm -hmm. sort of twanged imperfect pitch, variable pitch sort of notes with what sounds like a harp, but being played in a way that you'd more, commonly associate with like i don't know like a guitar or mm -hmm. uh like maybe even a slide guitar 
And the way that it's written is so smart because the root notes always stay consistent in terms of not having that variable pitch. There's a solid root note like boom, 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 boom. But then the top notes Mm -hmm. in each chord that's being played the twang, like, boing, 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 boing. Mm-hmm. And, and that's never consistent. And so it, 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 it allows, it enforces this kind of like almost drunk feeling of like you're, it's kind of confusing. And you know what the notes are supposed to be because of the root note staying consistent and informs your brain on yeah. what notes are supposed to be playing in the top part of the, the chord. Mm-hmm. So the fact it, it yeah it, it's essentially written in a way where it's giving you clues that there are quote unquote wrong notes that kind of slide in to correct themselves and it works and it's very interesting and it creates something new and it fits with the visuals it fits with the story it fits with everything and yeah it's comedic it's bizarre and what was even more impressive was how later on as the film goes on uh the it, it starts to ad- adapt ad- adopt like a more traditional uh more uh emotional seriously toned sad orchestral kind in line of line with the character yeah yeah and it and it and it transitions to that and has different themes at the right moments in the right scenes and it feels just as effective in the sense of uh, being properly scored and orchestrated and written and composed. it's And it's a very different style from that other theme I was talking about, which gets reincorporated a lot through the movie. That's probably the most mm-hmm. common one is that like harp twang thing. Yeah. But the other one's just, you know, it doesn't show up as often, but it's just, it's so professionally done. And it's kind of like a surprise of being like, oh, you can do this too. And it was just such a joy mm-hmm. hearing hearing the score and throughout yeah, the film. It does really match the like surreal, manic nature of what's going on. It does <clears throat> perfectly complement it. Um, I'm curious how you feel about the the special effects and the production design as applying to, especially these uh, these kind of f- <laughs> uh, creatures that are walking around. There's like a duck. Frenchy, and yeah. <laughs> like the, I mean, it, it's funny because all these weird things. The 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 comedic tone of this film and the bizarre, you know, like the harsh uh, style, the huge style of this, and and the b- bizarre nature of everything happening. You're not forced to be wondering whether or not that's possible, and you're not forced to be wondering. Mm-hmm the inner mechanics of like, okay, is the, should the pig be making a pig noise and a duck noise? Where are its (laughs) vocal cords? How does it digest food? I'm not going to think about that because it's obvious just that it's not what the movie is about. And it's more of like an aesthetic. Yeah. It's an aesthetic and a visual choice. And it adds to the, it, it it helps enforce the tone of the rest of the movie, <laughs> right? It helps enforce like what mm-hmm. what it's going for creatively, and it's not like it starts and ends there. No, you know, like the like the Willem Dafoe character who I haven't really mentioned much. Uh, love the prosthetics on him, by the yes. way. Um, the commitment to that is awesome. Yeah, um, great. Of course, makeup. the performance is wonderful as well. But like, he's got weird character quirks. Like when he's eating, he just puts his head up, and a bubble comes out and like pops with this certain noise each time. It's like I don't even know what to interpret from that. Like I don't even know what to read. But it's like, yeah, I don't understand that. But I don't know if we're ever supposed to. <laughs> no, I think it's just surreal and dreamlike, and like that somehow just makes sense in this world that just feels like it would be something that <laughs> would fit in just like the weird hybrid creatures and the baby woman and the cable cars going around in time periods yeah. where it doesn't make sense and these weird we haven't really mentioned the use of color but it's it's so uh it's so vibrant and uh varied and has sections of the film in black and white and but yeah the color is incredible yeah, this, I ju- i'm just so blown away there by their production design um and like to, and yeah, the, um the skies yeah especially those skies i just love that approach where it's just it's just ultimate creativity like i'm not being restricted by any anything in reality i'm just really leaning into the wackiness of this and 
but not, but not taking it too far. I don't. I, that's what is so crazy to me about it, the fact that it is somehow grounded in something. I don't know if that's helped by the fact that it is based on a novel, um, which I'm quite curious to read. Oh now, yeah, like, from a Scot Scottish author, um, and it looks like quite an interesting book, and a lot of the good ideas obviously come from that. But um, bringing it to life in such a like creative way, it's so, yeah, it's so vibrant, it's so it's so interesting and unpredictable and. While we have just been talking a lot about the comedy, there are definitely points where it does get real. It does have drama in the main character. I just, I just love that as she gets more agency and gets a vocabulary and like she starts reading and start caring about different things other than just sex. Um, what that brings out of her and some of the dialogue that comes with that. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just utterly in love with that. It's, it's a really good excuse to have a character that's essentially just unfiltered and is able yeah. to get placed into any scenario that an adult would be you know conditioned to expect as normal but she's immediately there in questioning uh so the dinner conversation right like why do i have to pretend to enjoy this i'm like you know good point <laughs> good point yeah the excuse to have her questioning these things through the eyes of a child is a very appropriate and fitting one it works really well for the film and yeah the idea that she basically gets to she gets to play basically like 10 different characters in one True. she's like kind of changing with each scene that passes so that must have been extremely fun and challenging for Emma Stone to play. Um, but it's also very fun and engaging to watch because there's just such a, such an interesting way to like explore a character arc with them. It's just such a good excuse to show a character changing very quickly without having to do big jumps in time, without having to keep to any logic. Um, it is a, a very smart kind of concept brought to life. This is my ideal Black Christmas 2019. Because I mentioned in the <laughs> yeah, last episode, yeah. there are some yeah. similar points being made about like gender commentary. Mm -hmm. There's the idea of like men and control and like seeing women as things to control. Like that's not it. That's not an invalid thing to bring up, and that's an interesting thing to explore. Yeah. But there's very different ways <laughs> that you can explore gender commentary <laughs> in a film, and depending on how competent of a writer you are and how obnoxious of a person you are, you'll come out <laughs> with two different uh, <laughs> two different pieces of art. My uh, with all, with all the compliments I've already thrown, my favorite character was actually the the owner of the like whorehouse in in she Paris, the Catherine Hunter character. What that a voice. what a memorable even though she's not in it much, she's got that voice. Yeah. That that the the costume design like covered yes. in the tattoos and her weird little quirks going for the lobes. The height. And, like, this whole commentary on the the age and the it's kinda of like you know the scene from Barbie on the bench with the acknowledging the kind of older yeah, women and the and how people treat them differently, and that that was another good dynamic when she's on the boat too with the uh, older woman that she kind of bonds with, and that's what gets her to start reading. Damn, this is really just better, Barbie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, kind of. <laughs> yeah, um, when well, Mark Ruffalo is like getting upset with her reading, and he just keeps throwing her novels into the into the ocean, and the old lady keeps handing her a new one. Um, yeah, just really funny dynamics and these really memorable characters that just come in and out and have different perspectives. Like uh, the um, the fella who's with that old lady on the boat, mm -hmm. who's kind of like this. He's kind of like a nihilist almost. Yeah, he like he like takes joy from bringing her down to. He's like, I guess he calls himself a realist or something yeah. like this, and uh, shows her all the poor people. And, and his philosophy is anti philosophy. Yeah, yeah, and he's like his whole thing is like propping himself up by putting everyone down, I guess. Um, and it like brings the character to her knees, but she learns like a mm -hmm. important lesson, and she always tends to have quite an accurate assessment of people. Like the whole, like the whole way the film wraps up with her, her husband that she finds out about, I guess ex-husband. Um, 
and she she just kind of goes out of curiosity and just completely assesses him with 100% accuracy and is like I want to go now cuz I realize <laughs> I realize exactly what's going on here and you're you're a freak. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> and the, yeah, the comedy that comes from that and the kind of the reminder of like uh yeah, this is definitely like a type of person that's exaggerated and controlling and insane but uh yeah, the, these are <laughs> This is a commentary that is apt and uh, applicable, despite its surreal nature. I'm glad Christopher Abbott is getting more work because I like him. Yeah, I've only seen him in a couple of things, but I thought it was a, a good, memorable performance, even though yeah. it was uh, only in a small amount. Yeah, he's had a bunch of small roles throughout the years, and he's been in some good stuff. Yeah, I remember him in It Comes at Night. Yeah, he was the lead role in a movie called James White from 2015 that I thought was fucking mm. awesome and just nobody saw. And I don't know why nobody saw it. Oh, really? Got like yeah. Basically no yeah, that happens sometimes. Ratings. Mm-hmm. Big oops. I'm curious if there's anything you didn't love about the movie because I was I was really like trying to wrap my brain for something. No, there's nothing. There's no of, criticism but... that I have about this movie. I, I, yeah, I couldn't think of anything because um, I've seen a few complaints about like some of the like the the CG or this and that, but none of that ever bothered me. It really. What do you, how do you? Yeah, well, how do you complain about that? What's the complaint? Just that it doesn't look convincing, or it's like. I mean, neither do the guys. I, know, I guess it's, it's a fucking style. Yeah, it's almost <laughs> like a cartoon. It's so it's so crazy and over the top. Like yeah, it, there's so much of it that it, yeah, it all seemed intentional and. Man, there's just so much to appreciate about every single yeah. scene. It's so unpredictable, and the costuming, and it's just so much detail, and the the humor to that writing. It's just, mm-hmm. it's just an ounce of joy from beginning to end. The title cards between the scenes, also. Yes, yeah, they're just beautiful. The, yeah, just yeah. like paintings, but moving. They're moving, yeah, and they're on frame for only a few seconds. But it's like, yeah. wow, so much dedication and work put into that. And uh, what's your interpretation of the the title? Poor things. So I've been trying to think about that. Like, I wonder. I haven't. I haven't put that much thought into it. <laughs> so try, I was thinking maybe it was something to do with like, um, with the infantilization sort of angle. Is that is it sort of a joking, re- jokingly referring to the women in the movie as poor things, like the fop might, or mm-hmm. or is it like a double entendre with the the poor things being the women, or maybe the you know, they actually show the the, the poor people at one True. point. Um, lot, or you, you could say every character is a poor thing, perhaps, from certain perspectives. Um, I don't know. It's, it's, it's just, the point is it's very thought-provoking, and I haven't stopped thinking about it, and I, I can't wait to see it again. No, not at all. It's like it, it's incredible to have a movie for me where just so much of it is still in my brain after only having seen it once and the soundtrack mm-hmm. like i can i'm pretty sure i was in the yeah. right key <laughs> for that when i was recreating mm-hmm. it. <laughs> like that's a very unique and very memorable and striking just every everything about it yeah can't wait to watch this again like it, it's it's a movie where like if anybody wanted to see it again and I was around somebody that, you know, I was able to see it twice or whatever within that week. Just socially, I would have just done it in a heartbeat. Like, oh, hell yeah, I'd see this mm. again in theaters right away. There's so many things in theaters Absolutely. that just feel like kind of an obligation. Even things that some people say are, like, great that I'm just not as mm-hmm. eager to, like, go out and check out. But this is something that I could definitely make time for again. Yeah. And it's, it just feels it feels rare to... I just... Love the comedy angle. I think that's so so rare mm-hmm. <laughs> to get it at this kind of quality and this with this much to say, with this much of a backbone, with this just everything comes together, every technical element, every, just all of it. It's uh, it's pretty masterful for that, and it's it's probably my favorite film from him, to be honest. Uh, I would probably also say that. I think I got because a lot of his films have a they, it's like an intentional sort of distance they have, or like mm-hmm. a kind of coldness which like enhances something like the lobster or a killing of a sacred deer but it also does keep you a little bit at a distance but the i just love the tone here it's uh it yeah it definitely explores things more thoroughly emotionally like on a human 
level. Yeah. Like not just how the characters act, but also like story wise. It digs a little deeper. Yeah, exactly. Very, yeah, incredible film. I gave it a nine. And uh, I've talked about it like fucking twice. And now I'm like, okay, I I got to give it a 10. What am I doing? It's my 10. Yeah. It's my favorite of 2023. Got to do it. It was an easy 10 for me. Yeah, it changed so it. I'm seeing that everyone's like, everyone's bordering on like a nine for this. When I look on Letterboxd, it's like, nah, come on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know in your heart of hearts. Yeah. Just do it. It's, pr- it's my only 10, I think, from 2023 so far. Um, this is a once every few years at least <laughs> type of great movie yeah 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 you got that novel you got the actors that believe in it you got that director with the vision yeah you got mm. that score this man yeah this is this is what i'm looking for this Ooh, is exactly what i'm looking for my editor is uh putting together a video that i already recorded so i'm just gonna since this audio is going to them also i'll just put this right here and I'm giving this one a <laughs> wait. I'll do that again. <laughs> and I'm giving this one a ten out of ten. Thank you. All right. Then you can put <laughs> that in there. We can have them in both. We could. I'm reusing audio. Mm. I'm reusing content, guys. Smart. Um, I'm getting lazy. <laughs> no, that's just that's smart right there. <laughs> Never work hard. <laughs> work smart. <laughs> Mm. yeah incredible movie fucking uh can't wait to see it again it's great i want a 4k blu-ray i will you know sometimes i have a very funny thing in mind and i'm like i would make i would make like a threat or something that would be like elite i would get (laughs) like i would get like investigated by the fbi or rcmp if i said these words but i'm like yeah i shouldn't say that joke i can't say that joke it doesn't make any sense Mm. Sometimes I just I want to say what just comes to mind is like a funny, edgy thing, but then I can't. I mm-hmm. can't do it. Cooler heads prevail. Yeah, it's not like the old internet anymore. <laughs> yeah, it's not like the old days. <laughs> not like I ever did that in the old days either. But <laughs> <laughs> you you just see it more. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, there's a film. That Alex recommended. That is a film. I thought it was about time we talked about Ken Loach, perhaps one of the more important British film directors of our time. He's he's kind of like the anti Hollywood director. Mm-hmm. You know, I mentioned uh, a, I can't remember what film we're talking about. Uh, I mentioned that in horror, it's one of the few places where audiences seem to be okay with uh, miserable endings and things not working out in some way or another or arcs being completed or whatever. There can be some kind of unsatisfying end or not even unsatisfying, <laughs> yeah. just miserable end. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, you can of course include Ken Loach in there too. Uh, this, is, this also reminds me a little bit of the Spider-Verse episode we did a few months back where we had a minimalist and a maximalist film in the same episode. It's quite contrast to Poor Things, where uh, Ken Loach's kind of specialty is this naturalistic style, often using a lot of unknown actors uh, with a with a focus on uh, working class struggles um, and trying to highlight uh, things that might not be in the public eye like in The Wind That Shakes the Barley, which is the 2006 film I recommended, is based on the Irish War of Independence, which, and the, the older I get being British, the more I look back on my education oh, with like, just a, shame, a shameful, a shameful lens. Like the that stuff sucks. that I've learned as an adult about, yeah, <laughs> the occupations in Africa, India, what we've done to the Irish and... Like, as you grow up and you're like, why Why do the Scots and the Welsh and the Irish, they like all hate us. Why does like, everybody hate deal? British people? <laughs> it's like, what are we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's like, yeah. Oh, there's, there's some pretty <laughs> there's historical, <laughs> generational <laughs> conflicts going on here. Oops. And of course, yeah, that's Ew. the focus of the wind that shakes the barley. It's the, yeah, the British occupation and the these guerrilla wars that happened. Um, it, specifically in this film is set in 1920 um 
and the kind of pushback and the the fight for independence uh led mostly focused around in this film the uh the the Killian Murphy character and his brother being the main focus and the inevitable tragedy that kind of comes with that um yeah i i one of the things i love about ken loach is how <laughs> he's definitely not for the crowd of people that keep keep your politics out of my movies <laughs> he's definitely not for that crowd yeah. <laughs> it, does, yeah. it doesn't really get more political for than sure. this like he's a he is a deeply political person he's i don't Everyone think he's about the labor party good. anymore but um it goes beyond just like lip service to any sort of political thing he's in the writing, it references policy, it references laws, uh, depending on the film and what it's trying to tackle, it references uh, zero-hour contracts, the gig mm -hmm. economy, um, all these different things that you can kind of do your own research and delve deeper into if you like. And he'll often, um, I know he doesn't do the writing himself, but he often works with writers like Paul Laverty, who wrote the script here. Yeah, that's pretty much... Like all their films, I I think like almost all of yeah. them is that combo. Yeah, um, but they tend to have at least one character who is more of a kind of a, a, a reference to a deeply political character that has these really strong opinions and will reference things like mm -hmm. trade unions and this and that. Um, and I I went on a bit of a Ken Loach binge uh for this uh nice i didn't just actually. watch the wind that shakes the barley i i watched um kes from Haven't 1969 on. sorry we missed you from 2019 good movie and uh riff raff from 1991 um so i kind of wanted a, a broader okay. understanding of him as a film uh of, of a director have you seen uh um, i daniel blake yeah i'd good. already seen okay, i good. daniel blake um and i think that's probably his most well-known and highest rated film um and out of that bunch it was actually sorry uh, we missed you that i connected with the most but okay. um I, I i loved them all uh, i thought they were all all had qualities and all had similar stylings to them um but even going back to kess which i'd always heard about in the uk it's quite an important film in the uk um for its approach and how i don't know he just gets very convincing good performances not only just from unknown actors but often from children as well and that's kind of mm -hmm. what stands out about Kess to me because the main character is a very young boy um and he's excellent in it and f yeah for a film from 69 it's like wow so <laughs> there's no excuse for this uh being as bad as uh, some of the examples you see um and unlike the other films i listed the wind that shakes the barley uh kind of stands out for not really being a contemporary setting in the same way. And he's, he's done a couple of historical movies. I think he did one about the Spanish civil war mm -hmm. or something, which I haven't, I haven't checked out yet, but he tends to explore. Yeah. More contemporary, like Riff Raff from 91 that I mentioned, Robert Carlyle was like a builder in the nineties. And it's yeah. talking about, yeah, the trade unions this or sorry, we missed you. Where it's talking about Amazon drivers and care workers and things like this, things that are still, uh, relevant they are lived happening. experiences well i guess not I can, to say that relate to. this isn't still relevant you can't even say well that. yeah you can't say it. that's the thing like the the irish not as much period pieces that is what i should say yeah and uh i guess yeah the lived experience angle is that i'm not going to pretend like i know i'm not a an expert on irish history at all and i found that that element of it um quite informative and uh i was gonna ask you some questions honestly because <laughs> I, I know oh really well i'm you must know more than i do about perhaps yeah because there's i mean there, there are uh, many different conflicts with uh the irish that have gone on for generations be it the potato mm. famine the troubles the yeah the war for independence here um all the stuff with the ira so i was i was actually going to ask you about um because i was you know the the whole film is about independence and then i think of okay so there's the uk which is what england ireland scotland and wales right and that's the united kingdom 
and that has a single. Uh, are we cleaning the Channel Islands? I don't know. What the, see you? I think that's why I, I need your help. What the I, fuck I are lived, those? I lived on Jersey Island for a little bit. What the hell is uh, which Jersey is an Island? island off of Fr- <laughs> <laughs> it's an island off of France, which is owned by the British, I guess. It's uh. But so then that's just part of. Britain? I lived there. I guess it it technically is. Okay. I think we still own like Gibraltar and random stuff like that. Okay. Um, <laughs> I was just gonna say so. I, I looked up uh, the pri- the current prime minister of Ireland. Like, Ireland has a prime minister, unless uh, Google lied to mm. me on the front page or something. Uh, Leo Varak- Varadkar. Uh, and then I looked up the prime minister of England, Rishi Sunak, but that's also the prime minister oh, of the UK. Wishy. So is Ireland under... So does Ireland have two prime ministers then, as in one for Ireland and one for UK, which presides over Ireland? or res- Like, how does that work? It's it's quite politically complicated because there's there's Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland. Oh, um, yeah, and it only half of it is owned by the Brits. What the fuck? Um, I guess that's that's what the, it, it's very confusing. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah, crazy. and I, I feel I feel yeah, I'd, I'm not confident in my knowledge in it, and I'd. I'd prefer an Irish person to chime in. Oh, sorry. Because um, I, I definitely do not know um, all the implications and uh, details and, sorry, intricacies of uh, the complicated geopolitical generational conflicts that have been going on there. And the, that's obviously what the film is exploring is this fight for independence. So the fight for independence that they had in this movie, like, what's the, the current state of it? Are they, like, really independent? Not really? Well, that was kind of the conflict of the movie. It was that philosophical question of there is a uh, there was a peace treaty signed mm, towards yeah. the end of the movie, yeah. um, and then that's when the brothers kind of divide. And one of the brothers is like, "We need to give this a chance because I believe this is a, a way forward." And the other one thinks uh, the Killing Murphy character is this. It's not enough. This is compromise freedom. We're still True. really yeah. under the under the yeah the thumb of the british empire and it, there's a there's a line at the in there's a i love that scene where they're all debating um mm-hmm. after the uh, uh the peace treaty is put out there and they're arguing in that room it's really ken loach's strength like these dialogue scenes where they're arguing over different political concepts and exploring them there um but it's mentioned in that scene that it would be naive to expect that level of freedom when at the time in the 1920s, India and Africa were still occupied by mm-hmm. the Brits and just really, I don't know, there's so much dialogue exploring these, these sides. And I feel like the, the kind of grayness and you can, you can really see b- the, both sides of the brothers where they're coming from and why they're acting the way they are and the tragedy that comes from that and the ultimate commitment Killian has, uh, to his yeah his dedication to total independence and there's a, there's a real important moment with that character where he he executes someone he's known since he was a young boy for um, yeah. kind of ratting out uh him and some of the other freedom fighters and yeah he puts him down and there's a a very good tell don't show scene where he talks about uh Going, going to the mother of the child he put down, because m- most of them are like seventeen to nineteen. They're all like yeah. young people. Um, yeah, goes to the mother and they silently walk to where they buried him for six hours, and then she says, "You know, she never wants to see him again." And mm-hmm. it really emphasizes that kind of close knit culture that they were all experiencing, and the line in the sand that had to be crossed, and like you can't really go back from something like that. You know, you kill. Yeah. <laughs> Someone you've known since you were a child, and it's like it's elevating things to a degree where he felt like, yeah, the peace treaty, it, it, it was, it's not enough for what he sacrificed, and uh, I thought they sold that very well. Um, yeah, like they just immediately go back to training, and it's like I thought, I thought the way it wrapped up with the whole, the brothers and the execution stuff was is so heartbreaking. Um, the ending, great. Yeah. Uh, girlfriend, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a it's a typical like miserable Ken Loach ending, but it's the ending the story needs to kind of put the full stop uh, emphasis point on the 
I guess the ultimate kind of toll that these uh, empires have left in their wake, and the kind of <laughs> you know, and the the, the misery that it, that that has caused, um, and how yeah, the, the politics seeps into the the personal and destroys families, destroys homes. It's, yeah, uh, very sad. I, I think that the way that this is written. Uh, in terms of like the the brutal sort of emotional moments that happen that carry obviously a, a lot of weight, uh, they're sprinkled mm-hmm. throughout the film and they're happening frequently enough to you know just give this overwhelming sense of I guess dread <laughs> uh, as you're watching it. Yeah. Like um, you know they're escaping from uh, the prison or whatever, and you know just having that moment of the guy saying. I don't have the key to the cell and then just having yeah. to leave your, your mates like the three mm-hmm. people in that cell like that's fucked that's like you don't want to think and about the escalation that. from that too but then you also think yeah certainly there must have been some scenario like that like these things are based off of real life so that adds some yeah. extra weight too. and that's what leads to um, that execution scene exactly that yeah the, the people they left behind were all executors and they're like well yeah. I guess eye for an eye because they they kidnap that that British character actor, that's yeah, in British stuff, um, and put him down. And the the way that the guy getting executed kind of like accepts it too, and he understands that that's like what needs to be done. He's not even really like mm-hmm. protesting against it that much. And the whole no, we screams, know, like, yeah, you'll never be free. Yeah. What do we send to your mother? Like, uh, I couldn't think of anything to say, and she can't read anyway. Yeah, like, yeah, that's brutal. That's depressing. It's sad. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah, the letter thing is very sad. One of my, f- I think I, it has to be my favorite line. It's like right near the end of the film and just like perfect for writing and structuring it this way, having this powerful of a line at the very end. It's when he's about to get executed, he says, it's not too late, Damien. And he says, for me or for you. That's crazy. Mm-hmm. That's like a yeah, lovely, very just, powerful way to end it. Yeah, for for your last words, essentially, to just, obviously you're going to be haunting that person's mind like you're and you know giving the audience something to really contemplate and think about and question yeah really really great writing there's a lot of great dialogue through that whole sequence yeah, well through the yeah. whole film to be honest but um it comes to a head especially when the brothers are more combative with each other and his his brother's begging with him you know you should have you should have sons and daughters and teach them to be gentle and happy yeah and like he's like desperate and there's just there's something so tragic about it because yeah you can see where both sides are coming from yeah it's one of those movies where i'm watching it and i'm like fucking why why do why do people gotta be in war <laughs> you know it sounds so sappy i know and i don't want to be one of those guys like can't we all get along and i don't want to like pretend <laughs> like there's some sort of fucking real solution to conflict right now because you know it's, a lot of war is just defending yourself from people trying to go to war with you, but mm-hmm. fuck, it's depressing. It's like it's always just over fucking nothing. It's always over just something so meaningless and like power and control yeah. and like culture and fuck religion and uh, it's stressful and it's it's annoying that this is just like a part of humanity that exists. Yeah, and we're well, like Krogan's. Yeah, we're just warmongering. Yeah, um, and it's important for media to show this. It's important for for films to yeah. tackle this and to be uncompromising about it and to be brutal about it in a way where you can go like, oh, there's some real consequences to this and they're not good. And this is probably why people shouldn't be doing this sort of thing. Yeah. When especially when there's so much media that exists out there that is really fetishistic mm-hmm. about war. Right. Absolutely. How many how many war movies yeah. are like, ooh, war cool. War is cool, and you're like, bam, bam, you call of duty, blah, 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 blah. Like, mm-hmm. that's well, the emphasis is probably on socially or scale of it. Or, yeah, like, oh, yeah. isn't this epic? And there's a big blah, 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 as if it's like a recruitment campaign video. Nah, mm. yeah, act of valor. <laughs> right, we need. I, I think anti-war films are important. Yeah, I agree. But uh, and and the way he's able to avoid the sensationalism of it is uh, quite admirable too. Because it does, it does feel like it's not trying to misrepresent something. It, it it's no. kind of the inverse. It's trying to represent the facts. The they reference something like the Defense of the Realm Act, where uh, public meetings are banned. That's how the kind of story begins, where they're just having a they're having an innocent hurling game, 
before the British soldiers come in because of this Defense of the Realm Act. Yeah. And break it up and wind up killing a 17-year-old boy by tying him up and just murdering him in a barn because he refuses to speak English and says his name in Gaelic. Um, so, yeah, it's like a good uh, jumping off point to get that, that story moving. Yeah, and, uh, it happens pretty quickly. Too. I like the implied violence. Yeah, very quickly. I like the implied violence of that. Yeah, the implied violence. Much more effective to me than... Because there's, in contrast, it's one. It's maybe the only thing I didn't really love about the film. There's, there's like a big shootout at a certain point, and it's, it's almost presented as like obligation. Um, cause it's de- I don't know. That's that was the sense I was getting. Like it's like it's not what Ken Loach is interested in. He's not an action director. <laughs> no, no, no. I know what you mean. I think that what was hurting those scenes the most was the sound design. I yeah, think that I it was that the, the like click and like gun click and like grenade click and like pow like that felt a bit way too like (laughs) movie-esque or video (laughs) gamey and you know those sensational elements are kind of present there like i don't i i'm not willing to say that that was like ken loach's choice because a lot of people were going to movie and someone's responsible for the sound design i don't know who knows who knows Right, but yeah, I felt like that stood stood out in a negative way that wasn't really consistent with the rest of the film. Whereas other parts of the film that were very explicit didn't feel that way, like the like fingernail pulling scene. I didn't find that to be mm-hmm. like uncalled for or no. uh, giving the wrong vibes. And what's interesting about that is uh, I don't think there's any other Ken Loach film I've seen where I've looked at like a practical effect or like a, you know, like a kind of a gore effect even Mm -hmm. and been like, wow, that's a really well done effect. Yeah, I I know that down too. Most of what he does is like the beginning where it's like, you know, you kind of imply it and leave the viewer Mm -hmm. to imagine it. And honestly, one of his his most recent film, The Old Oak, there's an example of that that I feel didn't work very well. So I was kind of, I was kind of like, anticipating some... yeah i saw you i saw um your rating about that i was going to ask that because i love the idea of a film mm-hmm. uh go- going uh comment going for the commentary on the dying pub culture here but uh, it's a little bit not, about that it's just so together. unfocused it's about like four different things oh, and right. like there's no central character almost kind of and, yeah you'll, you'll mm. i'm sure you'll check it out at some point you'll understand why it's not as well received yeah i'm not going to rush to see that one there are other ones i'll get to first yeah. but um it's a misstep yeah for it's sure. unfortunate to hear it's got a bunch of stuff yeah. that i like about them in it but it just doesn't come together as like a whole piece like a lot of his films do and yeah on the um well this while it's on my mind on the anti-hollywood note i won't say which film it is um sure but you know that tr- you know that trope in um just so many films uh especially Hollywood films where someone like falls off a cliff or something and then someone quickly grabs with one hand and they're hanging off there with them, holding the entire weight of a human <laughs> as they're hanging off with them type thing. Did that happen in Rebel um, Moon? <laughs> God, I think it, I think it actually did. Yeah. Anyway. It's like a part where she's hanging <laughs> off with it. Yeah. Um, but something like that happens in one of these Ken Loach films I watched. Except okay. it plays out how it would in reality. Oh, great. Like, that I, sounds I, I really awesome. stood out to me because it was like, oh, my God, like that's how it should be. Yeah, that's Hell exactly yeah. how it would be. And I love that about his style of filmmaking. And that is, yeah, that's why that scene, that shootout scene did stand out to me in uh, When mm-hmm, the Shakes of Bali. Because yeah. it, it wasn't just like the sound was definitely uh, <laughs> standing out to me and sounding more, way more kind of like stock and like just not that well integrated. But it was also the blocking. It was like... It it seemed like obligation. It's just clearly not what his interest is, like <laughs> like the action side of it, because everything else is excellent when it's talking about like the the politics and the philosophy and the the character dynamics and the the, the human side that isn't the the shooty shooty. Um, yeah, that that scene did stand out to me, but and that was the only one of that nature. All the other stuff was realistic to me, because um, everything else, as far as the period piece nature with this coming out in 2006 and you know, obviously mimicking the uh, the look of 1920 i loved all the costumes mm-hmm. and the the detail to like the the printing press they're using towards the end and yeah referencing all of this 
this accurate stuff in the vehicles they're driving around and all this all of those kind of details to the mise en scene or whatever yeah uh were very good it's um, it's simultaneously reserved but also really ambitious especially for an independent film yeah yeah i couldn't quite find the budget but it yeah it seemed to stand out compared to a lot of his other works especially um, i think it has to be under i think there's there's like a rule for con like you can only be a part of official competition if it's under a certain amount so you'd probably be able to figure out just based on what the requirements were for 2006 at least what it's like under but i, I don't remember okay so i, I just did a quick <laughs> tertiary google and it reckons estimated around six and a half million pounds which yeah is fairly low i suppose yeah um, sounds about right for what it is for for what it's doing yeah yeah i would say that's that's actually quite a good use of a budget mm -hmm. Th this film stood out to me at least from the ones that i've seen from loach slash laverty as being one of the most scripted i guess out, out of the ones that i've seen however i still do appreciate yeah. that as with i think every one of their films that i've seen they love doing this thing where someone i you exactly know, may or may it. not flub a line or maybe they mm -hmm. stutter but they keep going and there's obviously a maybe conversation with the actors beforehand like no just keep going finish the scene we'll keep it in and it works it actually makes it feel more natural yeah yeah it really feeds into the naturalistic Time. It, it really it really does add to it and yeah I exactly what you were saying earlier with um you know we're so used to seeing hollywood films or films in general doing things one particular way like you know the cliff mm -hmm. thing right exactly yeah. like that with dialogue uh ken ken loach mm -hmm. is able to say no i'm gonna do it this way and there's a reason why i'm doing it differently and there's a benefit towards it. I love choices like that. That's the whole point of making choices in filmmaking, right? For me, anyway. Yeah, yeah. There's a... Uh, I was really connecting with the Liam Cunningham character, uh, who people might know from as Davos in Game of Thrones. A really, really good character there, too. Um, but he's he's like the, the trade unionist character, I think. He's the one who... Uh, he has like a break... Uh, like you were just saying with the dialogue in that scene where they're talking about the uh, the peace treaty uh, where he's giving his perspective and he he does like stutter um, mm -hmm, and yeah, yeah well that adds to see it it just feel it just does it does ground it it makes it feel like well yeah that's what happens when people aren't always perfect Hollywood smiles and it's all like <laughs> yeah. controlled yeah. and produced if you listen to how anyone talks. In real life, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If you yeah, just yeah. listen to anything, you'll notice a difference. Yeah, and I, I just, yeah, I loved all the all the political discussions and the the yeah the the Republican army kind of arguments and yeah, it feels like real. England people. will still rule you with their landlords, capitalists, and commercial institutions. I think it's one of his lines, and it's like, man, I, this is so interesting to me. This is so fascinating. Them trying to solve this. Because it really is a, an underdog story. Like, it makes it immediately... Uh, the stakes are extremely high with that that young boy being killed in the first, like, 15 minutes. Um, this is life and death. This is... These are people's homes that are being talked about. This is... Man, it, it just really makes you feel for these people and their, their plight. Uh, and, yeah, I just love all the economic angle and... Uh, just the beef they have with these British soldiers. There's a line I noted down where they're commenting about how much they're paid. A, pa a pound a day out of our pockets to pay for that swagger or something. Yeah, um, yeah. When a, pa a pound obviously back then was a lot of money and a lot of them were unemployed. Yeah. And, and the word swagger no prospect, meant something so. different too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, and they reference like, yeah, aside from referencing like Africa and... Um, India. They also reference the uh, the Boer War. That was one thing I did learn about. Um, uh, yeah, and they're like, yeah, so we can we expect what the Boers got, can we? And all these kinds of things. Yeah, um, I'm sure there's just a lot of shit that I missed. Just not, mm -hmm. you, you know, anybody that doesn't know what like Union Jack means wouldn't know what that line was referencing. Yeah, yeah. 
uh well the, yeah there's a lot of history here uh there's a line that's like you know 700 years i think is the term that's uh, the number that's referenced and so there's mm -hmm. a, a lot has happened here um and yeah i feel like i've only just scratched the surface and there is, there are there are other loach films about uh irish uh tensions uh his film from the 90s hidden agenda is about mm. the irish troubles which is an extension of basically what was happening here with the ira and uh, i mean it it, it it leads all the way to contemporary politics like that was a big drama with jeremy corbyn his links to the ira and um Oh. all sorts like it and and in Wasn't brexit as well um yeah yeah well brexit there were all these like fuck ups with the uh, trade in ireland it just it just goes on and on um and there's so much context and there's so much to read about um and it's just nice for it to be kind of packaged in this way where <laughs> yeah you can kind of it's like an, a good entry point a good way to get your foot in the door and start yeah about this kind of stuff it's it's uh very consumable and easy enough to understand for someone that isn't familiar with the political history at all. Um, mm. And it makes, you know, it's it's so well done that it makes me interested in learning more about it. It makes yeah. you kind of want to seek, seek out and un understand what, what the hell all of the particulars were about, like, you know, historical conflict. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just yeah. There's there's just a lot of depth and a lot to chill on with his films, um, even with that minimal style. I like that they got the Catholic Church in there because that is definitely something that I've heard mm -hmm. about. Uh, Ireland is yeah, that's the Catholic true. Church a, is a very clashing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and there's that comment from Killian: the Catholic Church sides with the rich, or whatever. Mm -hmm. a bit of commentary in there with that. Yeah, just booting um, everybody out. Get out of here! Yeah, yeah. Can't speak. Don't disrespect speak this holy space. I'm the church. Oh, There's so many good lines, though. It's, <laughs> it's not the will of the people, but the fear of the people. That's yeah. another fantastic line. Things to think about. Things to think. It's very quotable. It's a very quotable film, and it's not a film that a lot of people know about at this point. Like it was successful for the time, but like I remember you recommended this. Everybody, the poster on the subreddit on mine and on the podcast subreddit people are like what's this movie like, what oh really interesting yeah i'd always been kind of intrigued yeah. to watch this one i'd always like yeah it's been, been a watch this one for a while yeah but it's yeah i don't know if people are put off by the period piece nature or just people just don't know you know if the, if the, <laughs> if the history and the education is like hiding these kind of stories i don't know if i i, I partially recommend it because of the killian murphy uh Oppenheimer thing that maybe people would. Oh, it's Oppenheimer. Let's go back it's and see Oppie. what else Oppenheimer's done. <laughs> it's op. <laughs> <Dark time. laughs> yeah, I just like in Loach films, there are uh, just the way they use characters to represent perspectives and something we've been bringing up a lot, but having them still feel like characters. Feel um, like real people. Have, But yeah, they feel like people. They actually, more than a lot of films, actually. They're, like they, you could bump into someone from a Loach movie yeah. on the street. Um, that's how they feel, uh, and it, it, yeah, it just sells the the conflict so much, so much greater. Um, and especially, I feel like everyone's going to have a different Loach film that they would connect to based on like your lived experience, because that's what was really getting me about. Sorry, we missed you, and the tragic mm. nature of that. Yeah. Um, like having like carers in my family and stuff it just it just hits a little bit differently like seeing these underrepresented issues like getting some uh yeah getting some proper yeah. screen time and get, telling get, real stories explored and like of real people yeah and and criticizing it in like a biting truthful way and it's like mm -hmm. yeah this we need to <laughs> be talking about some of these issues and i think yeah i think this deeply political uh minimal style like is very effective at communicating these ideas and especially shining a lens on more like working class struggles that are ignored you know he loves these miners and unionists and the cast is all about like the 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 abuse of 
kids in school, like in the sixties. Right. Now, like <laughs> oppressive <laughs> and horrifying, it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's always course, so yeah. grounded. Like it doesn't need to be mm-hmm. sensationalist or like super over dramatized or anything. Exactly, like yeah. you don't need that to tell an impactful story and to present it in an in a relatable yeah. way. I c- I could watch most of his movies that I've seen so far without needing subtitles, but Cass, you you one hundred percent need it. It's like okay. the thickest Yorkshire accent um, I've ever heard. <laughs> I, I was like, oh my god, because it was also like all these I, phrases and like things from the sixties oh as no. well. So it's like, man, I don't <laughs> like I don't even know what you're saying half the time. <laughs> it's all these crazy yeah. phrases and things. I definitely needed it for for this one and I like all of his movies honestly mm-hmm. I was yeah. so happy the old oak I went, went, watched a screener copy because I had COVID during VIF and they gave me a screener mm-hmm. copy I was so happy there were English subtitles <laughs> I was so happy because yeah, <laughs> be I wasn't screwed, sure if yeah. I was going to get that <laughs> like saved yeah because that's a real like it's it's a real British thing um, it's very accentuated here the class division um, mm-hmm. And so the the nature True. of having this focus on a lot of uh, working class people it's a, it's a thing in this country that people like you know they disrespect like or they associate northern accents for example with like lower class or it's somehow beneath someone who's like from London or whatever um, and it manifests in ways that a lot of people I don't think even are aware of um, in the subconscious and this deeply baked in class structure we have here that is so so blatant um once you start seeing it um and yeah being honest with yourself it's uh it's quite upsetting um but <laughs> just the the way we we divide ourselves and we're on a tiny island too like, yeah <laughs> <laughs> every half an hour it's like a different a different uh accent that's a crazy and, uh, way to think about it too yeah yeah so it's like, man, why are we, why are we dividing over, over these things when we're just arguing over the wrong things? We're like, why are we disrespecting each other over like accents and where we're from? When, <laughs> yeah, such is such is the story of humans. Such is the story mm-hmm. of life. Yeah, Which people are getting yeah, over nothing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> mm-hmm. I just love that they, he's found a way to give that voice. Yes. Give that perspective a voice in cinema. And in a um, very unique outside way. Outside of things like, yeah, in a unique way, because it, it is different to like a, this is England or something like this. Um, yeah. Well, there's a lot of people that try to tell stories like this, but they just wind up regurgitating the same sort of thing. Yeah, they can't find the right angle. Or, you know, like there's a very particular kind of Sundance movie that, you know, tries to be Wendy and Lucy sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, I know exactly. What you or mean. just where it all just kind yeah. of starts molding into the same blob. Hmm. But yeah, Ken Loach, very watchable voice, and I'm always interested in whichever film he comes out with next. And uh, yeah, I thought that this. Uh, I guess I'll just have some mild criticisms about this. Uh, I thought. Uh, Maybe in like the first half of the movie, I was like trying to like find more of a focus or maybe there was just like too many characters, but it Mm. really came together in the second half for me and it just like absolutely flew by. And then some of the music choices uh, a little bit near the beginning felt a bit weird. Uh, And then there's like there's a the part where he's trying to convince them not to shoot the guy on the floor and i forget his name uh that's the game of thrones fella the um yeah there was some weird music and editing happening there like it was kind of quite was, chaotic yeah yeah I don't, that i'm not sure gelled with me but just very very minor criticisms very super super yeah minor criticisms i do agree with that but it was the uh I thought Killian's performance there was very powerful. Oh yeah, um, he's great throughout. Just throughout the whole film, to be honest. Yeah, future Oscar winner. Yeah, he's, mm. and he's yeah he's a great central character to kind of base everything around and get the perspectives of. Yeah, um, he's got an interesting career. It's crazy that this was after Twenty Eight Days Later too. 
Yeah, it was after 28 days, and then what was like Batman after this? It's like, wow. Sunshine. Okay. And then Batman. Oh, of course, Sunshine, of course. Yeah, I need to I need to revisit that at some point. Um, but yeah, I loved that dynamic with the brothers. I loved when his, I guess you can call it his girlfriend, gets in the mix and the tragic end to that there and her performance when, well, and the brother's performance when he comes to, with the letter and she just like, starts oh, yeah. hitting him. and Great scene. Yeah, very powerful stuff. Yeah. Um, loads of fantastic scenes. All the performances are yeah. great. Incredible ending. Great writing. Couldn't ask for much more, except maybe, I don't know, I felt like I could have used some wider angles at points. Mm -hmm. But, you know, <laughs> just minor criticisms. They just, uh, the way they write these scenes where, like, just receiving a message, like an important message, becomes this whole, like, sequence of, it's this little boy, and he's like, oh, I can't find this really important message, and they're, like, trying to get out, like, tease it out of him, like, what was it, what was it, while the other ones are looking, like, where did you come from, and they're just looking for this message, and it's just, like, a realistic human way of uh, delivering exposition, basically, it's like, yeah, this is, this is clever, this is real, uh, it's always an interesting angle that is being taken here, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I just love that minimal style. I'm giving this one an 8 out of 10. It was sitting at like a high 7 throughout, and then that ending was bumped it up. Mm. It's definitely something that linger. Yeah, I found it fairly consistent throughout. I was, I did have the questions at the midpoint, um, as you did, like, where's this, where's this going? But I feel like it does... It does fully explore it and wrap up nicely. Yeah, Loach is kind of like, he's like the inverse Edgar Wright in a way. You know, mm -hmm. he's completely maximalist and he loves genre filmmaking yeah. and he loves like a lot of these tropes and whatnot. And there's, there is a time and space for that, but there's also a time for this too. Yeah, I feel like this would be a good second watch movie. Yeah, yeah, I'd happily watch this again. Yeah, strong, uh, strong out of 10 for me, four star. Damn, and I thought you would rate nice. it a one because you're British. Yeah, down with the Irish. <laughs> <laughs> Keep the war going. <laughs> Some say it's still going yeah. today. Mm. Oh, yeah, very much is. <laughs> right, you ready for some questiones? Gotta be. Right, let's head over to the Sardonica subreddit and pluck a few questions from the question thread over there. Just like Shandor left, asking us this. Is there any media your parents barred you from watching growing up? Growing up, I wasn't allowed to watch Adult Swim. I knew some kids whose parents didn't let them watch Spongebob. It's <laughs> unfortunate. Um, my parents were weirder about video games for some reason than yeah. films. Because like they were fine introducing me to like Terminator and Robocop, and like Alien and shit like that, um, but my mum like caught me playing uh, Bioshock One Ugh. that I'd like borrowed from a friend, um, and you know early on you've got the uh, what's that? You've got like a metal tool in your hand that you're like beating people to death with or something. Um, but mm -hmm. yeah, she like saw me beating a splicer to death with a yeah. <laughs> metal pole and was like, what is this? Turn it off. This is horrible. <laughs> um, and she was weird about like GTA and stuff like that as well. Because I don't know. It's just parents of that generation, like they just hear, I guess they hear like a news story of Grand Theft Auto. That sounds horrible. And then what you find out that? fucking 20 years later they were doing fucking mushrooms and all this shit like they were just so they <laughs> yeah, were, they, yeah. and they didn't even test their drugs. They didn't they just did anything. Mm. They just, someone would just fucking like give yeah, them something crazy. in a vessel they'd be like what's this? I don't know and then just go on a fucking better. <laughs> Every single one of the baby yeah. boomers are fucking drunk drivers. Okay? Ask your parents <laughs> yes. about that shit see if they'll be honest mm -hmm. about that. Come on. Yeah, and then they just hyper fixate over like restricting their kids from like everything, like no weed, no it. And so they like overcompensate in this other direction and go super Christian and yeah. shit. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, no, no, it's, it's, it's a very common story. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. happened to a, it's happened to a lot of people. Yeah, my parents were. My parents also showed me Terminator, uh, but were weird about like they would always fast forward through sex scenes, which. 
probably fucked me up right. <laughs> and gave me like, some really weird... that's funny because that, i think that might be a little bit of a cultural thing because i know <laughs> that was America never an thing. issue like 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 sex was just in like quite a lot of stuff growing up there was a uh a vhs in uh my house and they pointed it out and said don't you don't you ever play this movie? And I didn't because I'm not a. <laughs> what was it? It wasn't as much of a rebel. It was the Rocky Horror Picture Show. <laughs> it was just the, oh, the picture of the lips there. <laughs> and I was just thinking, like, yeah, what yeah, the yeah. fuck? Why did you even own this if you, th- like, why, did, why is this in the house? Yeah. Do you watch it? <laughs> I don't even know. Like, why is that there? I'll have to ask them about that. Oh, that's hilarious. Yeah, that's really Because I've funny. never heard them talk about that movie. I've never, that, it doesn't seem like the type of movie. That they would even enjoy. <laughs> so I don't know yeah. what the fuck that was about. Yeah, the sex one is. But funny. I just remember the 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 black background and just the lips, and I, I just like assumed it was like a horror movie or something. Hmm. But yeah, because I've normally heard that about um, Americans, especially. Yeah. Where they they're, they're fine with the violence, but as soon as anything sexual, it's all very. We Hush. import a lot of our culture <laughs> from uh, America. <laughs> Whereas, yeah, yeah, of course. Whereas, I don't know, the, uh, some different attitudes in Europe towards some of these things. Um. We're Americans <laughs> that call ourselves not as bad as Americans, is what we are. <laughs> but culturally, we steal a lot. Yeah, them. but I mean, consider considering how like oppressive a lot of parents are, mine, mine were fine. Those are only the real. Yeah. I remember like a little bit weirdness of, over like uh, South Park because of its... <laughs> these, these things that with reputations that prece- preceded them, but yeah. like if if my parents had ever done that to me, like this is the one you cannot watch, I I would have watched that the yeah. next day. I would have snuck it. Yeah, like <laughs> tell me not to do it, and I'm gonna want to do it so much more. <laughs> I'm sure my brother did. <laughs> I'd be yeah, I'd be so much more curious from that. It's like, well, why? What do you not want me to see? Then? I was a good kid. <laughs> I was a I was a good little child. Mm. I thought. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't with stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they were. Uh, they wouldn't let me watch The Simpsons, which is like so tame by today's really? standards. Oh yeah, but when The Simpsons That's came funny. out, it was it was considered edgy. <laughs> when The Simpsons came yeah, out, yeah, it I was remember. fucking crazy to have a kid say the word "damn" on TV. You're mm-hmm. not gonna make me do my damn like for a kid to say "eat my shorts." Like that was that was fucking that that was unheard of yeah he was edgy yeah he was yeah. edgy, edgy season scared, one boy. of the simpsons was edgy for the time and that now it's just like so fucking tame <laughs> yeah, um, but like, what yeah, i would yeah. do i i did rebel because i i loved the simpsons uh and i found it hilarious so i would just that they would have their tv on in their bedroom and watch the simpsons mm-hmm. when they thought i'd gone to bed and they would have the door open a crack and i would watch it through the crack in the door and just like silently on the other <laughs> side of the door, be like watching The Simpsons. <laughs> oh, wait, so they'd still watch it? They would still watch it, yeah. I just wasn't allowed to watch oh, it. Oh, that's funny. It was a weird, like, <laughs> oh, kids can't see this sort of thing. I wasn't allowed to watch uh, Power Rangers when I was a kid because it was violent. And they thought there was oh, this whole. Oh, I was banned from that, actually. It was, it was illegal in New Zealand. Yeah. Yeah. There was this whole, like, if the kids see. The people punching, they're going to hit other kids, which I mean, might be yeah. true. I'm not even, like, that's probably that, true. Yeah, I think it was one of those things where there were a few stories of it and then it like spread yeah. to all the like paranoid parents, kind of like GTA and South Park and stuff like that. Yeah, just read the Bible instead. <laughs> There's violence in that. <laughs> they'll, you'll that's have it, yeah. kids do it. If you read the Bible to them, they'll do, be doing incest instead. <laughs> They're all worse. Yeah. Um. Genocides. <laughs> <coughs> yeah, they were weird about video games, but it, it wasn't ever a content thing with the video games. It was like, mm. if you... So we didn't even have a console. So I would, yeah. have, been, I would have had an N64, but I had to go to my pr- friend's house and play it. Um, so by the time mm. that we were even allowed video games, my brother and I saved up to buy ourselves an xbox so when the xbox original came out that was our first oh, the original console, yeah, yeah. And we saved up and bought it and yeah by that point i was like what 13 or something so like the content thing wasn't as much of an issue i guess um i was watching a shit ton mm. of horror movies at 13 but i guess my mom just gave up on trying to tell me no she just <laughs> she would like come down just like look at the, all the titles that i rented she's like you're gonna turn into a serial killer 
or something like just just like just insult me basically and walk away and not not, not even try anymore oh that's hilarious yeah it's funny how like inconsistent it can be with the <laughs> yeah the limiting like the what the kids what the kid it's the it is a joke in the simpsons isn't it the the what does she always say? Think of the kid. Think of the children. Like she's yeah, always nurse Lovejoy. <laughs> posturing to that. Yeah, that's right. There was, you reminded me of South Park. My parents would not let me watch South Park. But one day, my grandma, my dad's mom, she was looking after me. And I, w- I don't remember what age I was. I must have been like 12 or younger. And we went mm. to the video store and she was like, oh, you can pick out a movie. I'm like, okay. So I just like picked out a South Park VHS. It had like three episodes on it. She yeah. didn't even she didn't question it. She just assumed, like, oh, I guess he's allowed to watch this sort of thing. <laughs> and then we brought it back and I watched it with her. And oh, it was really? the episode where Butters <laughs> learns how to masturbate. <laughs> <laughs> And and there's like, I don't remember there's definitely like he goes That's into the bathroom episode. and then like there's you hear audio and then the, like I'm pretty sure they like show white stuff at some point. And he's like, what's this white stuff? And, blah, blah, blah. and that's happening. The entire yeah, episode. Yeah. She was laughing. My grandma was fucking laughing. Oh, she loved she, it. Yeah, she liked that, <laughs> which nice. is funny because yeah, cool all I grandma. hear from my dad growing up is like the same type of shit that my parents did to me. It's like there's no way I feel like if if it was like my dad, like with him being younger, there's no way she would be like yeah. letting him watch that and <laughs> laughing at it. But grandma grandparents always love to like spoil and you know like, mm-hmm. let kids get away exactly. with it. Like, not my kid they'll be my friend <laughs> so that was funny uh well seeing as you mentioned that actually dab sloth 710 said thoughts on grandparents has any of your grandparents yeah. ever given you a movie recommendation my grandmother when i was a child introduced me to the actor jim carrey and his films because she loved his style of humor and how wacky he can be at times my uh I've only got my my I've got one nan and one granddad left. Mm-hmm. Um my other side were uh gone uh when I was born pretty much, so I'd never really had a relationship with them. But my my granddad, one of his special interests is basically <laughs> war movies. Um mm-hmm. uh so that's one of the few things I can talk to him about. Uh specifically like World War Two movies. Um my nan like doesn't really care about movies at all. I had I remember having a speaking of uh, Lanthimos, uh, having a funny conversation with her because she hated the favorite for some reason. She went to see the favorite with some friends or something. And oh. she's like a history buff. She was a oh, history teacher for a long time. And then it turned out to be a lesbian she was movie. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And like not historically a- accurate at all. No. And that was like her big contention That's was great. like, well, it, it just didn't happen this way. And I was like trying to explain it, but like she just didn't get it. She just didn't. Um, I knew yeah. there must have been a person that had that experience and not know yeah, what they yeah, were yeah. getting into. That's great. Mm-hmm. That just makes it funnier to me. <laughs> yeah. Um, relatively good relationships with my uh grandparents uh they're not around anymore but i didn't really have any like movie uh related experiences with them other than that south park thing i told you about which was hilarious yeah that is a funny one yeah (laughs) um well george fuber has this to say I recently watched Saltburn with my girlfriend. Though I enjoyed parts of it, to me it came across as try-hard on the nose and sort of self-absorbed. When I brought this up to my girlfriend, she asked me why I don't feel that way about The Curse, which is a show I'm honestly loving for how weird and different the vibe is. I'm not sure why something like Saltburn, which tried super hard to have interesting shots, intentionally weird lighting, and overall very overt cinematography, feels try-hard to me. While something like The Curse, which also focuses heavily on weird blocking, interesting shot compositions and audio, and overall just being different, really does click with me. How do you guys make the distinction between a film or show trying too hard to be unique or cinematic and just coming across as tryhard versus this one that tries hard to be unique but does it well without feeling self-absorbed? Love you, Sards. Interesting. Um, well, I haven't seen either of those things yet. I, be- I was waiting for the curse to be finished for me to start watching it. So I guess I'll do a watch along for that this month. Yeah, I'm, it's I'm finally looking forward to checking out the curse. Out. Um, uh 
fuck. Somebody told me the episodes are like an hour long and there's like 10 of them. So I really shot myself in the oh, foot really? there. But whatever. I'll just okay. binge them in one day yeah. maybe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I haven't seen Saltburn, but I felt that way about her previous movie that people loved. Yeah. So mm. I can kind of get And what I guess mean. If Saltburn is this year's The Menu um, oh. to me, where it's like the kind of a bit weird movie that is goes viral on TikTok, I guess. <laughs> it's kind of that's all it really takes. For for a demographic that's never seen a weird movie before? Yeah, basically, yeah. It's like everyone's it's their first weird movie and it's like striking them a certain way because of that. Um and man, yeah, I won't I won't delve into Saltburn, but I, I agree more with this this gentleman here wrote in. But I I feel like it's it's difficult when I don't know, it's a weird criticism to to say you're trying too hard. I feel like, um, but I get what they mean. I feel like I, you know, I find myself saying that when it feels like it's trying to be something else, because it can yeah. try hard and be its own thing, and then it usually winds up working. But when it tries hard and it's like, okay, the word "try" implies that you can see what it was going for, but it didn't quite get there, right? Mm -hmm. Versus just doing it, yeah. That's more like where I stand on Saltburn, where it's like, man, I actually quite like the production um, and the weirdness of the the color palette and the lighting and stuff. I just wish it was in service of better writing. That's yeah. my problem. I kind of deal, boil it down more into that. That can um, do it. It's not, yeah, yeah, which was a uh, little bit of a similar problem to her previous movie too, uh, but I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I, you know, I, I've often said I like things that are weird with a purpose, not weird without a purpose. Not saying that I inherently like dislike things that are weird that might not have a, an explicit or immediately recognizable purpose, but there's a big difference to me between, you know, a movie like like a Quentin Dupieux film who just literally all of his movies are just oh i'm being weird for the sake of being being weird and that's it like rubber mm -hmm. was his only like digestible movie there's a huge difference between yeah. that versus like i don't know poor things right where i'm like oh the soundtrack yeah. is weird the the visuals are weird but it's in service of something and it's cohesive mm -hmm. and it Most fits like intent. a puzzle piece yeah. right um yeah there's a you know big difference between holy motors and the holy mountain would be two <laughs> films that I feel like are kind of going for the same thing, you know, being yeah, he, metaphorical and like visually striking, but I'm just not, I'm just, I don't know if I, I don't know if I believe what Leo Carax or whatever his name is, is saying. I don't know. I don't know if it feels like in interviews, mm -hmm. I can hear him talk about what inspired the film. That sounds genuine, but I don't see it in the film. I don't believe it in the film. So much about that director I don't like. Anyway, yeah. Hope this helps. Thank you for listening to my TED Talk. <laughs> Should we do one more here? One more. Let's end on this one then from It's Slider 19. Hey, gay boy and English boy. Has a film ever disturbed you so deeply that it actually ruined your day or even led to an episode of depression? In addition, what genres or kinds of movies do you seek out when you're depressed? What are films you'd recommend to someone who is depressed? Asking for me, I mean a friend. I'm I think you're your channels and a frequent listener. <laughs> Sorry, I thought you were. <laughs> yeah, I'm a big fan of your channels and a frequent listener of the podcast. Thanks for the entertainment you give me over the past years. I think you too and Ralph may Jeebus rest his presence on the cast in peace. Have some of the most nuanced and thoughtful perspectives and conversations on him on film. I always admire your opinions as they exemplify a true appreciation for the many separate and unique elements of film. That com that comment had multiple endings. Uh, I, Alex, yeah, I think you, <laughs> thank <laughs> you for the comment, it. by the way. Uh, Alex, I think you already know what movie I'm going to say, right? I think I've said it a bunch. Uh, no? Well, normally when you say that, I just assume it's going to be Synecdoche. No! You, God, um, I, don't, I don't... That was never a day ruiner movie. That was never... Uh, Dear Zachary is what I bring oh, up. Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. of course, of course. That's, that's a depressing movie. I remember having quite a disturbed reaction to that film, Nocturnal Animals. 
that like really oh yeah that was a great one um yeah that really got under my skin and upset Mm. me um in a way that made it memorable but if you're if you're in a low mood do you like seek out low movies i don't don't tend Um, to do that i don't think you know i here's here's an interesting perspective a movie that many people could consider to be a low movie, if it connects with you in a particular way that makes you feel less alone, can be a movie that isn't a low movie. I don't consider Synecdoche, mm-hmm. New York to be really that depressing of a movie. I feel I feel like the connection that I get from it is actually a positive feeling. Um, mm. Knowing that, you know, you can see someone else who at least from your own interpretation has experienced similar thoughts and similar struggles. And there's like a connection and kinship there. And that's just something that is valuable and important about art and why I think I feel like it's important for artists to be true to themselves and not pretend to be something else and, you know, be uncompromisingly brutal about what they're making is to find that connection. So I, I understand, I understand like sad things and sad moods. I understand like the fucking, you know, like how many, think about like genres of music. Think about the the types of things that people seek out in that regard. You know, there's a lot of people that are depressed <laughs> that seek out depressing music because it makes them feel more connected and less alone. Um, That's true, actually. I do associate that phenomena much more with music, like... If I want to feel sad, just put mm. on low roar or something. Is my current one. Um. <laughs> the same thing. The same thing exists with with film. The same. It, it, it yeah. exists with any art form. It it exists with. You know, you 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 could seek that out in like a conversation. You could seek that out in like a story of just you know someone's life story, right? How much of yourself is going into the art? But I think. What comes to mind for me is, um, I think part of the reason I loved Everything Everywhere so much was because it was, it just hit at the perfect time. It was like around COVID and all of this, like just awful stuff, like in my life had been happening, like in a row. And it was like just the right message, like packaged and just in the in the perfect way, like the message I needed to hear at the time. Um, Which movie? Uh, everything, everywhere, oh, yeah. all at yeah. once. Um uh, yeah, so that, that's like a more recent one that I feel like can lift your spirits if it's uh, if you're in a slump, perhaps. Um, but I don't know that's that's also part of I don't know, I don't seek out the more desperate or depressing films when I'm in that mindset because it's part of what I like about art is that it is able to kind of bring me to whatever the mood of the piece is trying to do if it's good enough. Um, and yeah, I will. I'll use music more for that. Yeah. It depends on the movie. Depends on how closely yeah. I connect to it. I'm not going to, if I'm feeling sad, I'm not going to put on Dear Zachary. <laughs> <It's> not, <laughs> yeah, yeah, not, exactly. I don't feel tempted to do that. I think that yeah. I, like the, the, is profundity a word? I think it might be. The profundity. I think so. <laughs> of, of an art piece funny, but... can help even if what it the tone of what it's going for is like depressing right cuz cuz yeah there's a lot there's you know synecdoche in new york is a great example it might be depressing but there's there's truths in it and there's mm-hmm. truths that that are very personal um yeah 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 i was going to add something but i forgot it's getting late here it's- nearly midnight it's getting late in my brain my, my brain's fighting i've been we're in the that. same boat here it's the late brain yeah i got yeah. <laughs> anybody wondering i got back on a flight like an hour before we started recording today <laughs> <laughs> i slept on the plane a little yeah so considering that i think we've got a pretty nice end episode it out of <laughs> end it finish it <laughs> <laughs> deliver us from evil <laughs> <laughs> we got a recommendation for the next episode from a surprise guest, mm. a super secret surprised guest. Ooh. Guest, a guess. To who could it be? What they recommend? Waterworld. <laughs> yeah, Waterworld. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Kevin Costner, baby. Right. Yeah, <laughs> never seen it. Have you seen it? 
A long time ago. A very long time ago. I, I remember nothing, though, basically. Um, I feel like it would be a fun thing to check out. Yeah, I'm looking forward <laughs> to it. Apparently a 4K has recently come Ooh. out or something. So <laughs> you can get on that. Ooh. Get that physical media collection up. <laughs> mm-hmm. We could do a Waterworld Avatar 2 double feature. <laughs> The water episode. I'm not being serious. I n- I never want to watch that fucking movie again. It was so boring. <laughs> All right, if you don't want to be spoiled for Waterworld, 1995, <laughs> Kevin Costner, directed by another Kevin, Kevin Reynolds, and watch it before the next episode comes out. These episodes come out every two weeks. However, you can listen to them early and support the show by going to patreon.com slash sardonicast or sardonicast.com and sign up for premium. They're both the same thing. Whichever platform you prefer, it's $2 a month. That's nothing. It's absolutely nothing. Help us. No, less Have you noticed coffee. how I've started doing ads on my main channel? Stop being a fucking mm. freeloader, okay? Get in here. Help us out. <laughs> Give <laughs> Alex and I a dollar each per month <laughs> yeah. for the content that we're making. P- please, P- please. <laughs> You're begging like the characters in the fucking film we watched. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Whatever. Uh, you, fuck it. Pirate or shit. I don't care. I'll be homeless. Uh, who cares? I love it. Um, we got a we got merch somewhere. We got a Sardonicast highlights channel on YouTube. Check it out. Um. Yeah, I'm tired. So, <laughs> glad we started with Rebel Moon and not having that be the third thing we talk about. That would have been a disaster. True. Yeah. Jesus. Yeah. My energy definitely picked back up talking about poor things. <laughs> poor thing. Yeah. 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 No. It's putting you to sleep like the fucking film. And I, my last thing to say on that, like there was one quote <laughs> from that film that I noted down. I don't even remember the context. There is a line in the film though. Come on, Mama, let him come and play. <laughs> That's a line in the film. <laughs> I think that was the Irish guy, actually, um, which is funny. Yeah, I don't remember. <laughs> There's some good, good lines. <laughs> All right, thanks everybody for listening. Bye bye. Have a happy bye, everybody. Water world bye.